my name is Rod Young, and I'm the CEO of Delta Dental. And I'm here just to introduce myself, and then I'm going to introduce Dr. Croston, and from the CEO of North Memorial, which is a, uh, North is one of our, our, not only one of our clients, but one of our friends and partners. And Kevin and I are now, we're twins, in case you haven't noticed it, okay? Can you tell? <laughs> so, Kevin, I'm going to let you have it, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. We're so uh, pleased to have this partnership with uh, Delta Dental. Uh, one of the things that's been missing for, uh, is the integration of oral health into overall health. Somehow those things got separated years ago, uh, and as witnessed by the fact, you'll see some of these statistics today, that uh, oral cancers are diagnosed much later when seen by a physician than they are by our dental community. And somehow the putting us in approximation with each other and uh, creating a professional relationship back and forth uh, will probably help that. That's what we're hoping for. So we're tickled to be here today. Uh, we're tickled that everybody's shown this much interest. Um, I want to give a couple things of thanks. Thanks to Jill um, and Stephen and Brooke, our patients, who are going to come and share their stories with you. Uh, they've been through a lot. Anybody that works in healthcare knows what that journey is like, and uh, we really appreciate and respect the fact that you're here today. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Crespo and, and Dr. Katamani, thanks for planning this event. Uh, looks like uh, you've hit a nerve. There's a, a good turnout here today. We hope it continues on for uh, in the foreseeable future. So thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. Everybody here, we, I think we've got a really good program for you. Um, at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Representative Matt Dean. Uh, most of you have heard of him. He's been fairly active. He's very active in the healthcare world uh, and has been a good friend to healthcare and to dental care in the state of Minnesota. So it's my pleasure to introduce Matt. Thanks, everybody, for being here today and for let me just spend a couple seconds talking to you a little bit about health care and uh, public policy at the state of Minnesota. First of all, I want to thank you very much for practicing in the state of Minnesota. Uh, in, uh, in this great state, we lead the country, we lead the nation in quality of health care. And uh, we don't always say thank you, and we're not always very appreciative in the way that we uh, communicate with, through a policy and uh, from the government, uh, so I want to make sure that I try to uh, always offer a word of thanks whenever I talk to groups of physicians and dentists and students. Uh, we want you to stay here, we want you to practice here, we want you to train here, we want you to get married, uh, but it is a great state to live, it's a great state to work and raise your family, and it's a great state to practice, uh, but we don't always show it that way. Uh, not with our reimbursement rates, particularly for dental that are 50th out of 50. Uh, we don't show it in the way that we reimburse hospitals through our public programs, through programs like Minnesota Care, which are half of the reimbursement rates of uh, private uh, health insurance. We don't show it a lot of times with the way that we integrate with other states and the ability to practice here and practice in Wisconsin or practice here and practice in Arizona or practice here and practice in Iowa. Uh, so the way that we communicate that isn't always as good as it should be. I can tell you that things are getting better and that we're working on it. Uh, so please, uh, please uh, know that, uh, that you have many, many uh, cheerleaders at the Capitol who want you to stay here and you want you to practice and, and do the very best you can. It's super exciting to see uh, dentistry and uh, what's going on in the mouth connected with the rest of the body. So this is a great uh, a, a a great opportunity to talk about where we're leading and uh, head and neck cancer uh, for uh, putting that into, uh, you know, getting the word out in terms of diagnosis and treatment for head and neck cancer and uh, the integration between, uh, between dentistry and uh, MDs and uh, oral health and the connection is one that is uh, one that is absolutely so important that we need to integrate that there's ways that we can do that in a ways uh, for how we pay for that, how we look at that, how you get that word out for the public. Uh, I think that that is, is so critically important. Uh, and at, at the Capitol right now, we're just sort of heading into the, uh, the rounding the bend and heading for home at the Capitol. Uh, so our budgets will be coming out. You'll see that very, very shortly from uh, the budget targets that are coming out. We currently have a surplus in the state so that there's not, we're not going to have to reduce our budget in the second year of the biennium. So you'll see um, some policies coming out. The targets were set last night. Within Health and Human Services, we have an additional 
uh, $10 million that we're going to be spending uh, based on uh, kind of a redefinition for CMS within Medicaid within the state for how we're doing that. Uh, so we're going to try to do that and make, uh, uh, spend a little bit more money within Medicaid to try to make sure that our providers are held even um, from the reimbursement rates that they had in mind. So that is my cue, I would imagine. <laughs> to either sing or uh, wrap up. <laughs> oh, they don't want me to sing. Okay, all right. <laughs> wise choice, wise choice. Uh, so anyway, um, thank you so very much uh, for what you're doing, and, um, and thank you for practicing in the state of Minnesota. Dr. Crossan, I'll give you the microphone back. Um, before we start the program, I just want to set the stage a little bit and talk about what we're here for. So we have, um, the goal is here is to really, um, is to talk about cancer and to, and to look at some of the changes that we've seen th throughout the last few years. If we look back from the year 2000, the rates of head and neck cancer have gone up approximately 6% per year. Um, and this is not only across the United States, but across the world too. Um, so we're seeing far more patients that have this diagnosis. We're seeing a completely different patient demographic also that has this diagnosis as well. Um, it's really important on us to have, um, um, you know, thoughts about vaccination, about obtaining sexual histories and screening because all these are going to be critical to be able to, do, to actually de-escalate stage of diagnosis and then be able to offer more, more appropriate treatments for our patients. So as I mentioned, since 2000, we, we've basically seen an actual increase in the, in the rate of HP-associated cancers, um, whereas the incidence of cervical cancer that we also know is HPV-associated has come down. And the reason why it's come down is because we have very effective public health screening policies to be able to screen for cervix cancer. Um, and we need to do the same thing for cancers of the actual head and neck. We've seen the rate um, increase, particularly in men, and as I've said, this is about a 6% rate of, of actual increase in, in the last couple of decades. We've also seen what was historically a male disease by approximately a 10 to 1 ratio is now become a 2 to 1 actual disease. So we're seeing far more men um, and also women get head and neck cancer. <clears throat> and this is really the first time that we've been able to bring professions together, both dentists and physicians and specialists side by side, so you can hear the same information because stage de-escalation, early diagnosis, so, so we can actually mitigate um, the, co the complexity and the cost of treatment is going, is going to be key. Um, I want to thank, and I'm very grateful for our patient speakers who are going to be here to share their stories. And you've already heard that both that um, actually Brooke, um, Steve, and uh, Jill are, are actually going to be here. So with that, I will have our first patient speaker, Jill, come up and say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. My name is Jill Sutcliffe, and I am from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and um, I'm a patient of Dr. Katamani's. When he asked me to come and speak at this conference, I was very excited, although I didn't realize that it was going to blizzard in South Dakota in April. So shortly after I'm speaking today, I'll be headed back to Sioux Falls, um, hoping to beat the storm and spend the weekend with my family. But um, thank you to Dr. Katamani. And, um, Thank you for being here. This is a very important topic um, and very near and dear to my heart. Um, I turned 50 in December, and I'm proud to say that I was excited about being 50 because I wasn't sure that that would be a milestone that I would achieve. And um, this August, I will be celebrating my 12th year since my diagnosis of stage 4 head and neck cancer. I was 38 when I was diagnosed with um, squamous cell cancer cancer in my left tongue. It had spread to my lymph nodes, and um, my story actually starts eight years before. Um, I was actually just moving to Minneapolis when I was 30, and I was married, and I had a two-year-old, and um, I saw a new dentist, 
And the dentist noticed a white spot on the side of my tongue. And um, he asked if I'd ever noticed it. And I said, no, that I hadn't. And he referred me on to a maxillofacial doctor. Well, at 30, um, I'd never heard of that. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was. And so I went to the oral um, surgeon, and he actually did a brush biopsy of the side of my tongue, and the results were normal, and I went on about my ways. And what you have to realize is that, you know, I'm a healthy 30-year-old, and um, I hadn't even had a cavity up until that point. So um, it seemed kind of unusual, but it was okay. And um, fast forward a few years, and I was pregnant with my third child, nine months pregnant, and I had a little um, bump develop on the side of my tongue. And so I went back in to see my dentist, and he referred me to the oral surgeon, who once again performed a brush biopsy of the area. Um, come to find out, the, the biopsy had abnormal results. But I am a healthy, um, I think I was 36 at the time, and I had three children. I was pregnant with my third. And I wasn't the normal smoker, drinker man that most people associated with oral cancers. I was young and healthy and vibrant, and um, so I was sent on my way to watch my side of my mouth. Um, over the next couple of years, the side of my mouth was sore from time to time, and I attributed it to irritation or um, stress, perhaps. I wasn't quite sure what it was. And so after a time in talking to my dentist and going back to the oral surgeon again, we decided that we would spit a mouth guard to my teeth and try to stop the irritation in my mouth. Um, one day when I went in to have the mouth guards fitted, um, the pain specialist said, you know what, I'm going to have this taken a, another peek at this by another oral surgeon. And I have to say that at different points in my diagnosis, I have had what I like to call angels that have changed my course of treatment. And that oral surgeon was one of my angels that day because he came in and he seemed a little agitated, and he said, you know what, we're going to take a, a biopsy of this area, and it's going to take a pretty significant chunk out of your tongue, and, um, you know, take a few days to heal and get the results back, but I think that's the appropriate treatment at this point. And it was a summer day in August, and I had four kids and a babysitter for two hours, and I thought, I have a list a mile long, or I can get this done, and I decided I better get this done, and it's a good thing I did because I was diagnosed with um, stage four cancer. It had spread to my lymph nodes. So um, I was sent to the Mayo Clinic, and that's where I met Dr. Katamani, who I deem another angel along my path of um, cancer. And um, my husband and I actually met with him and talked with him about the surgery that it would potentially have to have. And I remember Tom and I talking, um, we thought you looked very young. <laughs> we thought, gosh, he seems very confident. And like the surgery, he knows this is what we need to do. And sure enough, it was the right thing to do. We decided that we needed to get it done. So August 28th, as I was preparing for back to school, um, our oldest son was going into sixth grade, a new middle school. And our second son was first grade. Our daughter was going into kindergarten, and our youngest daughter was two. Um, I went down to the Mayo Clinic on August 28th, and Dr. Katamani completed the eight-hour surgery where they removed a third of my tongue. They replaced a piece from my tongue with my arm, and it then took donor skin off of my thigh. I had over 20 lymph nodes removed, and um, it took me about seven days to recover. Um, down at the Mayo Clinic, and I actually came home with an NG tube in my nose, um, lots of stitches, lots of bandages everywhere, and my seven-year-old wouldn't see me for two days because I looked so awful. Um, after a couple of weeks, we went through uh, a process of learning about chemotherapy and radiation and what the next steps in my um, cancer journey were. And so I did seven weeks of chemotherapy, six weeks of radiation, um, five days a week, and then I also chose to participate in a chemotherapy study that was being done at the Mayo Clinic at that time. Um, it was pretty intense. It was uh, really awful, frankly. Um, uh, a very low time. 
But um, I remember talking to Dr. Katamani at different points uh, as I would check in with him, and he would say, in time you will be at a new normal. Things will get better, and he was right. Things did get better. Um, the new normal is not what it was, and my new normal is soft foods. Um, I can't participate in eating the wonderful lunch that you were served today. I'm not able to have margaritas on the deck in the summer anymore, but I'm alive, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, my oldest son is now 22. Um, he is a medical student in Virginia. And when Jack left for med school, I said to him, you know, Jack, you are going to learn a lot from books and a lot from physicians and a lot from your professors. But being a physician is more than that. Um, being a physician is what you've learned at school, but it's also what you've experienced and what you've seen and what you've learned from others around you. So make sure that you keep your eyes open and listen to your patients and look around and, and see what you haven't learned in books. And use your gut. Use your gut to ask questions and to inquire further. If something doesn't seem right, explore more. Find more. See, see what the solution to the issue is. And I hope that he does that. Um, in closing, I, I guess... I'm, I'm, again, really happy that you're here, um, and my hope is that you are an angel to one of your patients and that you're able to identify an issue um, with oral cancer if you see a spot, a lump, or a bump, or something that just doesn't seem right. I hope that you're that angel to one of your patients. And I also want to say um, I was HPV negative. However, I have four kids, like I said, and I am positive that you should be asking your patients about HPV and you should be encouraging them for the vaccine and making sure that they don't just get the first one, that they go in for the second one. And I tell all my friends that too because it's imperative that we are able to give our kids the vaccine to potentially avoid an issue with oral cancer or cervical cancer or other issues that may come up for HPV. So I'm super excited that you're talking about that as well today. So. Um, I wish I could stay longer. I hear that Dr. Katamani has some awesome pictures of me <laughs> that I'll be missing, but I'm sure you'll enjoy those. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. Okay, thank you very much, Jill. That was, that was great. And on my slides, you'll see that Jill has aged far better than me. Uh, throughout this 12 years, I've lost all my hair, so I'm not sure what that says. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Frank Andre, who's an associate professor at the University of Minnesota. Yeah, this is sort of like old home day to me. I've known Kevin Crossan for about 30 years. I came up here from Chicago just to be his intern about that point in time, and uh, I've met Caitlin and uh, Deepak along the way. No, actually, the reason why I came up here was... Uh, I got interviewed around the country for, for ear, nose, and throat residencies, and I wanted to do a head and neck cancer-specific sort of residency. And there was a fellow here in town who's since passed away, a fellow by the name of George Adams. And he was talking about predictive biomarkers in tissues back in 1988. And that's a term that we use now. In fact, you know, it'll be talked about today. But uh, as soon as I met him and the fact that he was doing clinical trials here, I, I came here because there is, we have an interdisciplinary conference today there's been multidisciplinary care teams for head and neck cancer for almost 50 years in the state of Minnesota. And because of that sort of thing, routinely our survival is at least 3 to 5% above the national averages for oral cavity head and neck cancer when I've done those statistic views uh, through the federal government, the SEER website is what it's called. And then on top of that, when we've looked at multidisciplinary care where we involve dentists and chemotherapists and radiation oncologists along with surgeons, we see that we maybe even boost that survival even 10% more. So I'm pretty confident that I came to the right place to practice medicine because we're well above average for head and neck cancer survival rates. And uh, with that, I'll begin, uh, begin my talk here. When we look at uh, epidemiology of head and neck cancer, and I will move that one forward here, as Deepak had said, uh, there's about 51,000 cases of head and neck cancer now. There's about 13,000 cases of larynx cancer for a total of about 65,000 cases of head and neck cancer a year in the United States. That number was closer to 40,000. 
when I was in residency, okay? And, uh, and this represents solidly a 20% de- increase since 2012. And uh, with that, and we look at the risk factors, a lot of it's going to be attributable to the HPV epidemic that we have. But when we look at the basic risk factors, if we look at what happens with smokers, if you're a two-pack-a-day smoker, pack-a-day smoker for more than 10 years, you have about five to tenfold the risk for that. If you're a very heavy smoker, so that would be, it's hard to afford four packs of cigarettes a day now, but we used to see these folks. Um, marijuana is felt to be an emerging risk factor, so this is something that really concerns me with medical and recreational marijuana because it's very hard to do the experiments this way because you're trying to do experiments on something that, that, that's illegal nationally, so you run into the same sort of uh, issues you run with, uh, with, with how, to, how to keep up with the finances of legal marijuana in Colorado, so that's kind of a mess. But it's felt to be about 40 times the carcinogen load for marijuana cigarettes compared to a regular cigarette. So uh, snuff, it's about four or five times uh, the risk. This has been studied in some states to be able to show this at uh, West Virginia. Uh, there's Worldwide, there's a Swedish snuff that appears to be safe with less nitrosamines. That has not been put on a, uh, a list yet, but that snuff is not, I don't know if you could buy snus, is what it's called in Minnesota or not, but, that's, uh, but I guess if someone was saying that they use Swedish snuff because it's safer, it wouldn't be okay to just tell them that they're wrong, I suppose. Now, if we look at uh, risk factors uh, for alcohol, uh, when you look at moderate to heavy drinkers, we're always talking about at least, you know, more than two ounces of alcohol a day. So this would be the three, you know, at least a half, 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 a, half a bottle to a bottle a day wine drinker, you know, a six-pack a day beer drinker. And uh, you get about three or nine-fold the risk of oral cavity carcinoma with that. Uh, if you look at uh, heavy drinkers in France because of all the wine, and this is actually sort of a separate group because they get a lot of oral cancers and they got a, a lot of superglottic cancers as the wine that they're drinking bathes the base of their tongue. And they might be about 30 times the risk. Now, these are people who are having more than a bottle of wine a day, which is acceptable in some places. And then if we look at real heavy tobacco use and alcohol uh, use with that, you're about 100-fold the risk factor, okay? So now we're up at the ranges where you talk about smokers who are asbestos-laden too. So these are like some of the highest risk groups of any kind of a cancer exposure that you're going to find is what you get with the uh, heavy tobacco and alcohol use additionally. Now, if we look at what is human papillomavirus, and this, uh, a lot of these slides are excerpted for some talks that, I have to, that, I, that I'll give for the uh, School of Public Health over at the University of Minnesota. But what it is, is it's really 150 related viruses, okay? So it's a large family of viruses, okay? About 40 of those are spread by some type of human contact. About 12 of the 150 are considered high risk that can cause cancer. And I start out, there's 16, 18, and I'm not going to read the whole list. But when we talk about oral pharyngeal malignancy, in almost all of the cases, it's going to be HPV 16 and HPV 18. So those are the two types that are going to, there's a, you, you can find, if you, if you get 100 cases, you're going to find maybe three or four out of the 100 that are not going to be HPV 16 or 18, but that is what it is for the most part. So it's different epidemiology than cervix cancer and some of the other cancers that are caused by HPV. Now, what other cancers are caused by HPV? So the main one all throughout uh, medical history has been we've looked, at this, we've looked at cervical cancer, and that has been the biggest risk group, and that's why pap smears were invented, and that's how we even have these genetic pap smears that are being done, uh, done now in a, new, in a new type of testing. Oral pharyngeal malignancies, we're talking about 10 to 15,000 patients a year now, and, uh, and it's a fair, fairly high number. But then if you look at other populations, you can get the uh, anal malignancies are often HPV-caused, penile malignancies, vulvar malignancies, vaginal malignancies. So a lot of these malignancies that are caused by uh, sexual contact, a lot of those are more rare than cervical and oral pharyngeal, but they're still in that group of, uh, of, of, what's, of, of the risk factors uh, for uh, uh, of what's caused by HPV. Now, when we look at HPV overall as a public health problem, just overall, in the current population, there's up to about 79 million Americans that have had an HPV infection, okay? And, I'm, and this is all organ sites, but there's about 79 million Americans. That's not a small amount of the U.S. population. That's, that's, you know, that's probably a quarter of the adult population or a quarter of the whole population. There's up to about 14 million new infections yearly for HPV-associated infections. So a new 
And then when you look at HPV-associated cancers, and this is all organ sites, this is just out of the mouth and the throat, but there's a new one diagnosed every 20 minutes in the United States. So it's about uh, 27,000 or so per year that are diagnosed. So that's a large, large number. And then when we look at where they occur for us, because we're going to be talking about oral cancer today and maybe some other sites as well, but basically what we're talking about are oral pharyngeal malignancies. So they're not always that easy to spot like a leukoplakia lesion would be for all of us. And there's not a wonderful way to figure out precisely how to do screening for this yet, so there's not a standard screen for HPV-associated malignancies. But this is the space where if you were to sort of want to gag yourself or touch your uvula or something, you'd put your finger in and you make a circle, and that is where these malignancies occur. Some of them can occur as deep as the most deep part of the vollecula, so that whole tongue base is considered part of the organ site where these things uh, can, actually, uh, can actually happen. And like I said, there's about 10 to 15,000 cases a year of HPV-associated oropharynx cancer. And now, when we look at studies that have been done by Maura Gillison at MD Anderson and some others, we know that there are about 20 million adults with an oropharynx HPV incidence of infection. Those are the calculated numbers, okay? So we have a large number of adolescents and adults who get an infection one time. We have a disease where there's no screening programs, and we also have a disease that's just rare enough when it turns to cancer that it makes for a bit of a conundrum when we see patients. Because uh, what will happen is we'll get patients that come in that have their their, their partner, their spouse has an HPV-associated malignancy, and they'll kind of want to know, should they be screened? What's their risk factor? And these are all significant unknowns at the present time. Because if you divide 10 to 15,000 by 20 million, it's a pretty small dom denominator. So the hit rate or the attack rate for HPV-associated oral pharyngeal malignancies is pretty low for the number that are actually infected in the United States. And, uh, and I think that that slide there, that, that is the reason why they're going to talk a little bit later on about the need for HPV vaccination. And that's one of those things where how often can you get a vaccination that prevents cancer? It's like the only one that's out there. And uh, so that's a very, very important topic that's going to be covered in a little bit. Now, what we'll see in terms of in the clinic, and this will probably be gone over a little bit as well, but I wanted to have as being the first speaker, I wanted to at least give a little bit of information that people will be able to take off on. But what will also happen is that these folks will come in with a painless neck mass, oftentimes before you see the organ site itself. So it's a lot different than the leukoplakia patients or the mouth ulcer patients that have a neck mass and their stage three cancer. And, uh, and at that point in time, by the staging system that was up until a couple of months ago, which they're also going to talk about today, uh, there was, uh, they'd be stage three cancer. So as soon as someone would show up with one of these masses in their neck and you didn't even know that there was something in their tonsil or their tongue base, they're already at stage three malignancy. And oftentimes what we'll do is we'll get a needle aspiration of the, uh, of the patient in the clinic. Sometimes we'll have to go ahead and uh, as soon as we have a needle diagnosis of the, uh, of the neck, we can go to the OR and uh, then do other, uh, other, other testing on these. And, uh, and this marker, or the tissue biomarker, is something called P16. And that's something that almost every pathology lab can do in the United States now. And then uh, sometimes people will go ahead and do the actual genetic testing for the HPV virus as well. But uh, that's, that's the thing. And then just basic uh, treatment consideration. It's a stage 3 or stage 4 disease oftentimes. So for that, they're going to be talking a little bit later on about multidisciplinary treatment, which would include surgery, radiation, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, chemotherapy, radiation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, ways that you could combine these things, and they're, fairly, they're done fairly intensively still. They have both similar cure rates, the, the, no matter what modality that you use, and, uh, and then at times you'll find high-risk features in the pathology, not knowing what you're going to have when you go in to do a surgery that make you have to add maybe some other therapies besides that, like chemotherapy. And, uh, and what's nice about this, and this is the thing that I think is, uh, is, is, is good about HPV-associated cancers, is that in our practices, the cure rate for these is a lot higher than the standard head and neck cancer that is a tobacco and associated cancer. It happens to younger people, unfortunately, but the survival is a fair amount higher. 
it's it, 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 it's at least 20 percent higher than the other ones and then uh, and then it can also be worth in terms of the epidemiology of this once you start adding smoking or a lot of alcohol use to the incidence of an HPV associated malignancy the survival will progressively go down for an HPV associated cancer once you start having other risk factors added to that and uh, and because of all this there's trials that I'm sure are in in town here through the cooperative groups they're through uh, they're they're done I'm sure at all the all the centers in town and the idea is is that do you ha since this cancer is so curable do you have to go ahead and give the most intensive treatment that's been done for 30 years for head and neck malignancy so there's a very strong movement out there to try and de-escalate or de-intensify some of these treatment regimens so that people are not going to be suffering long term as much once they're cured so, uh, so there's a lot of concepts out there at a national level, and, uh, and one of the main ones is to try and go ahead and see if there might be ways that, are, that you could credential to maybe reduce the radiation exposure by 15 or 20 percent or so. And uh, you, you might have to go up to 30 percent decrease to really get rid of the side effects. And the other thing that's really important is that the uh, staging scale for the malignancy is actually changing in 2018. It's just February, I think, was the official time I... Someone else might know that here a little bit better than I, but, uh, but the whole staging system through the American Joint uh, Association has been changed, and that's going to be gone over today as well. So the, uh, so the little final take-home points, and I'll finish a couple minutes early here, is that uh, the HPV oropharynx cancer, it's a new disease, really. We didn't have good ways for testing this before 2000 or so. Um, when I was in residency back in the early 90s, there was this group of patients who would get tonsil cancers, or tongue-based cancers, and they were early stage, and you'd treat them with radiation, and they just seemed to do a lot better than a lot of the rest of the population. Those patients, I'm sure, every one of those is an HPV-associated malignancy patient. It's highly curable, okay, and that's a, that's a good thing to keep in mind, too. So it is a diagnosis of an advanced cancer in many cases, but it's more curable than the guy who's been smoking for 50 years. And, uh, and it's probably preventable with vaccination. And that's like a key point, like Jill Sutcliffe just mentioned, is that to, to, to put everything aside about being afraid of vaccines because they cause autoimmune disease or because any of the social things, I, I think that all of that has to be put aside because the, any of the HPV vaccines that are available out there that a person can get are going to be preventable of this and all the other HPV-associated malignancies. It's, 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 it, they're indicated up to early adulthood now, so I think that that's an important thing to do. And uh, there'll be questions in the panel, but that's uh, all of what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andre. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kathan Patel, who is a reconstructive oral and maxillofacial surgeon from North. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Will this just progress to the next slide? Or? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak at this uh, lovely conference. I think this is a very important topic to be discussed uh, between both professions, so I'm uh, thankful to be here. And my task today is uh, to talk about the different screening methods that you have, and the majority of these have been uh, kind of uh, broken down into two main parts. One which is the lab screening, and then the second one, which is the clinical screen, uh, screening that you get. So um, what I was going to go through is first the current screening guidelines, uh, and then the clinical scre uh, screening, and then I'm going to do a little bit of an HPV introduction, uh, some of it which has already been done by uh, my previous thesis advisor, Dr. Frank Andre here, and uh, um, also some history of the HPV uh, disease itself, and then some lab techniques that are currently in use, and then, uh, and then future direction as well. Um, in terms of the, the National Screening Committee um, back, in, uh, back in 2010 def defined screening as, as um, the process of identifying um, apparently healthy individuals who may be at risk for developing a disease or a condition. And there are several programs that have already been set forth with we already talked about cervical cancer, breast cancer, bowel cancer, and all of these screening methods have effectively helped de-escalate disease in, in a sense, or they've been 
they've been uh, discovered at, at, at a lower stage than, than what we knew previously. So these screening campaigns are very important for both disease detection and also educating patients about risk factors. Um, in the American Head and Neck Society also has, um, a screen, uh, they have a, a gold standard on screening patients and their statement uh, as of April 2017 stated that the current gold standard for detecting oral lesions with significant ma malignant potential includes a good history and physical examination. Um, if a biopsy is indicated, then, then definitely that needs to be done as well. But this was for oral cancer. Now we're talking about a new disease here, which is oropharyngeal cancer, and there we have a different take on it. So currently there's no scientific evidence that exists to support this approach at present, which is completely contradictory to what we had for oral cancer. And then also there's no evidence that oropharyngeal premalignancy or early stage cancer can be detected from any of these um, current available techniques. So it's easy to take a look in the mouth, but the ear, nose, and throat doctors have the advantage that they can scope patients in the clinic, so they have the ability to look in the back of the throat, but this is not something that is available to all the primary care providers out there, so it's, it's a little bit different. And then we have the U.S. Preventive Task Force that also recommends that you do not need to screen for oral or pharyngeal cancers because it doesn't do anything. So that was kind of, when I looked at that, I was like, well, that's a bold statement that's coming from, from the, the uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force. And they suggested that at this time, the American Head and Neck uh, Society recommends against the use of oral HPV detection systems as, as a screening tool. And any screening tools that are present should only be done through a clinical trial so far. So right now, what do we know about oral pharyngeal cancers in terms of screening? Absolutely nothing. So what does the ADA say about this? This is the American Dental Association. So what do they have to say about all of this? They had something good to say about, um, about it, which is there is insufficient uh, evidence to assess the balance of benefit and harm in screening of oral cancers in asymptomatic adults. But they only reserve this for primary care providers. And dental, uh, and, 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 uh, dental, um, and dental providers and otolaryngologists may conduct a comprehensive exam of the oral cavity and, 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 um, and the pharynx during their clinical encounter. But they also said that even though there is a significant impact on the treatment decision of these outcomes, they do, they do support a small, in terms of a visual and a tactile examination for people who, are, uh, who have risk factors. And that was it. Like, if you've got an asymptomatic patient, you don't necessarily need to examine them. But if you've got a smoker and a drinker, then you probably should examine these patients. Again, there was no talk in terms of oropharyngeal cancers. There's no guidelines at all for that. So again, we're in the limbo in terms of what do we do. Um, is it important to do this screening? You know, is, is it important? So there's a very good study done in India uh, by this group where they where they essentially looked at 84,600 84, patients. They screened these patients. And over time, they looked at them. They followed these patients. Like, a lot of them dropped off um, the study. But at the end of it, after 15 years, they found a 24% reduction in mortality for patients who, oh, thank you, uh, a 24% reduction in mortality for patients who actually had known risk factors for oral cancer. So can we try and emulate this to, to, to oropharyngeal cancers? I think we can. And they basically said that visual, uh, visual screening can reduce the mortality rate in users of tobacco, alcohol, or both, and produce a significant stage shift. So you'll be finding these cancers earlier, and you'll be treating these patients earlier, and you will therefore see a better survival outcome in these patients. Um, so sometimes screening is hard, especially in some of these innocuous lesions. So what do you do about that? So we're lucky that we also have adjuncts to these clinical uh, examinations that are out there. There's a lot of these that are available in the market currently. Uh, there's devices that, that are based on tissue reflectance. There's some autofluorescence uh, uh, aids out there as well. And a lot of the general dentists are actually um, 
have these uh, veloscopes that they use in their practice to diagnose. So every single patient that goes to a dentist is required to have a head and neck or an oral cancer screening at that particular point. So that's great for oral cancer, but it doesn't help the oropharyngeal guys at all. And, and so they've tried to use these adjuncts to try and see if they can identify lesions a little bit better. They have this Visalite Plus that essentially um, is, it's, it's, they use a, a blue-white uh, light to look at it, and what happens is when you're seeing these lesions that are very innocuous, very, not very easily noticeable within the oral cavity, when you see them under this blue light, they kind of seem to give you some degree of autofluorescence. They look greenish in color, and if they are abnormal cells, then they lose that, that reflectance, and therefore they're better identified, and that's the, that's the premise behind a lot of these visual aids that you get out there. Um, there is a lot of these, and then um, Jill was nice enough to, to tell us a screening test that was used for herself, which was the brush biopsy. So that has also been used as well, and this is a very good thing. What you do is it's just a simple brush. You essentially uh, rub it over the lesion, and the cells that you get, you put them over a slide, and you fix it, and you send it to the company. And what the company does is, is that they look at it and tell you if you've got a negative result, if you've got an insufficient sample, or if you've got an abnormal result, and at that point they'll say, okay, if you've got an abnormal result, then you should pro that probably warrants a biopsy, because a lot of our patients are very reluctant to have a biopsy. So it's, it's, this actually just helps you get to the next stage say, to say, I see a lesion with this, with this device or this adjunct, and I think you, you warrant a biopsy over somebody else who probably does not warrant a biopsy right off the bat. Um, so when you're looking at the sensitivity and specificity, it varies for premalignant lesions against the cancer lesions as well. So when they looked at a lot of these Visalite, Viloscope, the brush biopsies, and the toilet in blue, they found different specificities, and they were not all that accurate. A lot of these lesions, a lot of these devices would also light up inflammatory lesions. If you got, you know, hyperpigmentation, it would light up as well. So you've got a lot of false positive rates in them. Uh, our, our, uh, uh, our group has, is also working on a similar marker. It's called iSpy um, Oral Cancer. It's SPIOC, which is iSpy Oral Cancer. So we're working on that end. Our preliminary results show a good sensitivity of 89 and specificity of 76% in premalignant lesions. And then in the, cancer, uh, in the cancerous lesions, um, they have a sensitivity of 100%, and it's based on a lactin marker. So we're trying to do our part in terms of trying to find a better screening tool. And this is just an example of a cancer that you can um, see on the top there. And when you look at it under autofluorescence, it you can see it over there, and then when you add on these different markers, you can see how it lights up really well. And this is one of the cases that we use, and this is some of, the, some of this data is published and the other is in the process of getting published. Um, the one below is um, uh, high-grade dysplasia. You can see that it's not seen that, that well, but once you put it under some degree of autofluorescence, you get, um, you get, that, uh, you get that deepened, or, or a darker uh, field there, and then once you add the first marker and the second marker to it, you can see how it lights up really well. So this, how does this help us? It helps us in two folds. Firstly, it helps us in detection, which was a problem, but the second thing, it can help us surgically for the, uh, for the surgeons, who, it helps us in the, in, the, in the operating room because it will tell you where to take your margins. It's very easy to find margins in the cancer itself, the problem is when you end up having field cancerization or where do you take that margin? Because if you've got a cancer in the middle and then with dysplasia around, it's very hard to know where you stop cutting. So this would be a good adjunct or something like that. So what, if you're trying to look at what evidence-based guidelines that we have in terms of potentially malignant lesions, because we know that a lot of these oral cancers are, are, are predicated by having a pre-malignant lesion for a majority of the times, even though some of them do occur de novo, but a majority of them occur with a pre-malignant lesion and then progress to a cancer. So if there is no, um, if there is no clinical lesion evident, then no further action is necessary. But then if you do have a clinically evident lesion but it's a little bit innocuous, you can follow it periodically, and then if it resolves, then you're essentially done. But if it progresses, you can use... Uh, you can perform a biopsy at that point. This is where then the patient factor comes in. If a patient 
refuses to have a biopsy, then what you can do is you can bring in your adjunct at that point and then show them the result of that adjunct. And if it does, if it's, if it's negative with the adjunct, you can say, we'll follow you in a few months again and try this again. But if it's positive, then you can say, I think you really, really need a biopsy at this point. So that's, I think these adjuncts are pretty useful for that reason. In terms of the HPV virus itself, so I'm going to switch gears and move on to the lab methods of detection. In order to understand that, you need to understand what the virus is, what its molecular structure is, then you can try detection techniques. Uh, some of this was already mentioned, so I'm going to skip over this. Um, and I'm going to go into this. This takes a lot of you guys back to those classes that you wish you never had to attend ever, but <laughs> Frank and I look at this. We've looked at this a lot. It, this is like part of his daily, daily routine, I presume. <laughs> That's right. So um, if you look at the HPV genome itself, it's made up of, um, it's made up of a few different segments. Um, the, the two big ones that matter to us is the, uh, is the um, E1, E2 areas, those are big ones. The E6 and E7s are also important as well. And um, the, the reason why I said the E1, E2, those are important in DNA replication. It helps the virus to replicate. And then in terms of malignant transformation that occurs because of the virus, then the E6 and the E7 segments are more important. And then you have the caspid proteins, which are the L1 and the L2 as well. So what is the function of each of these things? I've stated over there. I'm not going to go through it. I don't want to bore you with the details. But the big ones that you have to worry about is the E6 and the E7 because the E6 is known to downregulate. Um, it causes P53 inactivation, therefore leading to, um, to survival and malignant transformation together with the E7, which essentially um, it activates uh, malignant transformation because you're inactivating the uh, retinoblastoma uh, protein there. Um, in terms of its oncogenesis, I just talked about this, but I'll go in one final time. So the E6 that you see over there basically binds to the P53, leading to its uh, degradation, and you, you lose the tumor suppression that way. When you're looking at the E7, it basically binds to the RB protein there, and then therefore the uh, E2F, which is the transcription factor, can go in and allow cell uh, activation and proliferation. In terms of its history, um, HPV was noted back in uh, 1983 as, uh, as a histopathological feature of uh, oral cancers, and it was detected in oral carcinomas. The, P16, uh, sorry, the HPV-16 was seen in uh, oral carcinomas in 85. Um, in the 90s, they found the viral DNA and the viral oncogen is expressed in a lot of tonsillar cancers, and in 2000, there was a high copy number that's known to be also integrated into the host DNA and also in, in the tumor nuclei as well. Um, HPV in 2007, that's when it was determined to be a cause not only of oropharyngeal cancers, but also oral cancers as well, based on the molecular epidemiology of these uh, viruses. So in the lab, how do we identify these lesions in the lab? So this is the tough part for, for pathologists as well. There's routine histology that you can do. There's southern blotting, so I'm going to go into all of these things that you wish you forgot and never have to look at it once you left medical school, but sorry, it comes back to you through me. Um, so in terms of histology, so an HPV um, lesion in ter or an HPV-associated cancer has a very, very uh, uh, pathognomonic feature that you will see over here, and it's described as a coilocyte. You can see these halos around this nuclei, and that's very, very pathognomonic for an HPV-related uh, uh, cancer. So and that's what it looks like on routine histology. It is used universally as a diagnostic procedure as well, and it complements a lot of the additional tests that you do. It's low cost, and the, small, the disadvantage of it is that there is a, whole, there's a small portion of these HPV tumors that do not exhibit such characteristics, so it becomes a little bit harder to diagnose those. So uh, when you're looking at the detection of the virus itself in a lab, you can do it one of two ways. Either you can look for the presence of the HPV DNA itself, or you can look for the functioning of the oncoprotein, the E7 uh, and the E6. You can look at that, and you can look at both of those at the mRNA level or the, or the um, protein level, and you can identify both. So in terms of immunohistochemistry for the P16 
surrogate marker. It's known to be an independent predictor of survival. It's highly sensitive, low cost, and it can be incorporated into a lot of labs. So it's easy to, and it, there's plenty of supportive evidence to use this. And you can use these on the brush biopsies that, that a lot of these uh, people who are doing these brush biopsies in the clinic, you can send it off and get the HPV staining just that way and it's sufficient. The disadvantage is, is the fact that you just don't know if it's already gone, undergone through the malignant process. So even somebody who does have, you know, somebody who's got the virus itself can sometimes test positive for it and not necessarily have a cancer. So that's where the disadvantage comes in. There's southern blotting. It's a well-established. It's reliable. But you can't use this on, on, on fixed formal in paraffin embedded um, uh, slides. So this is, it's not used that much these days. Um, in situ hybridization for, for the DNA itself, that is, um, it's used in a lot of FNA specimens. Um, and uh, it, it does provide a good histological context for this HPV in, infection itself. When the staining is a little bit off, it does lead to subjective uh, interpretation, so it's a little bit hard at that point, but it is more costly when you do an in situ hybridization. Uh, RNA, you can look at it the same way. Here you can do reverse transcription for, for the E6 and the E7 mRNA, uh, for the RNA there, and it's a little bit tec uh, technically challenging, and it's expensive as well, so it's not done that much. This is the main test that is done, and it's considered to be the gold standard right now, which is the DNA. You do a PCR on the DNA for the HPV. It's very, very, uh, it's very, very sensitive. It's low cost, and it's widely available. You can put it in a commercial format as well and, and um, use it. You can use it for FNA, saliva brush biopsies as well, and you can also use it in serum plasma specimens as well. Um, disadvantage is you can get contamination, but that's that's you know, catered for when you're doing these experiments, so um, it's, it's, it's a great test to use. And some people have moved on to a new thing, which is combination testing. So you use two methods to increase your sensitivity and specificities. And if you look at this, you can see the DNA PCR there um, with the immunohistochemistry gives you the best uh, specificity and sensitivity when you're trying to detect HPV. So there is some non-invasive testing as well. And the FNA is one of those. Uh, you can do brush biopsies, which is, again, not invasive. You can do a saliva test as well. And this is looking to the future, but it's still in the, it's still in the works. And then there is serum that you can use as well to identify HPV infections. Um, and with that, um, the, the conclusions that we can form from a lot of these in terms of clinical screening, we don't have that much for oropharyngeal cancers. There's a lot going on for oral cancers. And they're trying to translate the work, but again, there's not enough evidence for it. Uh, in the lab, there is um, immunohistochemistry uh, with, uh, with PCR seems to be the gold standard right now. And then the non-invasive techniques, they are showing some promise, but it's still far from being the gold standard of screening. And uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Idle. I'm one of the uh, second-year fellows up at North. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, current staging, which has kind of been alluded to in a, in a couple of the talks so far. Um, so nothing, nothing for me to disclose. So essentially what I'd kind of like you to get out of the, the presentation today, a little bit about the timeline for the release of the 8th edition, uh, the main points related to head and neck cancer, obviously specifically to P16 as well, um, how those updates have, have changed from the 7th to the 8th edition, and obviously, like I said, just those specific modifications for uh, HPV or pharyngeal cancers. So just a little bit of kind of backstory, really, about what the um, AJCC is. Uh, so in, back in 1977, uh, the American Joint Committee for Cancer came up with what they felt was uh, a system whereby uh, practitioners could communicate with each other patients could get an idea about um, essentially what their prognosis was going to be based on the type of cancer that they had. So, um, you know, just a, a really way of communicating, giving different, uh, varied groups of individuals a, a, a specific stage. Uh, so previously, we're on, obviously we're on the eighth edition at the moment. Uh, previous editions of this, previous kind of iterations were, were really just based on, let's give it a TNM 
and give it a stage. Whereas what they're trying to do with this new staging system is make it a little bit more personalized for these, for these individual patients so, so that you can uh, incorporate all of the available evidence and make it specific for that patient, which is obviously very important for them. Uh, so like I said, this was the timeline. This is um, as, it was, as it was put forward. Um, the eighth edition, uh, which came out on January the 1st, was originally published back in uh, 2016, but it's been, it was just kind of in the, in the working and coming through the, the publication process. Uh, so, uh, like I said, they've tried to incorporate the best available evidence, everything that is as current as is, as is possible, and get going for really level one evidence um, uh, in every single case as much as possible. So just to say kind of levels of evidence, I'm sure we're kind of pretty much familiar with that. It's, you know, we're looking for level one. This is multiple randomized controlled trials that we can look at and say this is, this is the evidence that we want to base our decision-making process on. Uh, so just really the changes from the 8th edition, obviously the 8th edition covers the entire body, but we're, co we're concentrating on the head and neck here. Um, so like I said, there is a now a, which is brand new, a separate, totally separate algorithm and staging system for HPV-associated cancers, which wasn't present before. Previously, they were lumped in with all of the other types of cancers. Um, there's also some changes to the oral T staging as well, and I'll go into that a little bit as well. It's not specifically related to HPV, but I think, still think it's pretty important to be kind of aware of that. And they've also changed the nodal system as well, so extranodal extension is now a, a key factor in deciding the nodal staging. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about the pharynx, there's three separate categories, like I said, three separate changes. Um, there's still HPV negative, oropharynx and hyperpharynx are still all kind of lumped together because they pretty much have the same type of biology, and then HPV is separate from that completely. Uh, just to also mention there's some changes to skin cancer as well. Uh, the, the, the T staging has been just changed uh, by the depth of the, the skin cancer and also perineural invasion as well. Um, nasopharyngeal tumors, they've kind of tried to get rid of as much ambiguity as possible in, in this, and they've just said soft tissue involvement uh, for, you know, essentially meaning masticator space to, to define your T4 tumors. Um, and also T2s are just involving uh, medial pterygoids, so just invading just slightly into the muscles of mastication. Uh, so like I said, there was, with regard to the T staging of the primary tumor, essentially, um, talking about depth, so um, this, was, this was the thing that's changed from before, obviously, before it was just a measure of, of the actual size of the tumor. You were just measuring it and saying, this is how big the tumor is, but that wasn't really felt to be a good indicator of how that tumor is gonna behave. So talking about just all oral cavity cancers, they're saying actually the depth of invasion is really what's gonna define how aggressive this tumor is. So you might have something that looks clinically very small, but is deeply invasive, and those are the ones that worry us, and obviously those are the ones we kind of think about. So um, there's three cutoffs, less than or equal to five, five to 10, and greater than 10. So just, just to bear those in mind. So just, just uh, a, a pretty straightforward picture here. This is kind of you know your T1 to T2 right lateral tongue, and this is just an example of a relatively kind of exophytic cancer. So this would, you know, looking at that, it would be you know, probably not very deeply invasive. So this is your kind of superficial kind of cancer. So I, I suspect the new staging is not gonna change that particularly. And then a little bit here, we've just got an example of what is a, a, a deeply invasive cancer. So just on the right kind of right retromolar region there. And that was deeply invasive in, and you can see the specimen on the right hand side as well. And you know, it, it's just an indicator of how big that cancer is even though you know, it's a bit like the tip of the iceberg. There's just not much on the surface, but underneath it's pretty huge. <clears throat> so um, like I said, oral cavity cancer, there's, it's still essentially T1 to T4, but it's just that that depth of invasion is gonna change how you classify it from a T point of view. So um, as you can see, you, know, you may have what was previously a T1, if I just take an example. So, um, so a T2 tumor, which we would say before was less than two centimeters, but if it's between five to 10 centimeters of invasion, it automatically brings it from what would have previously been in the seventh edition of T1 to now being a T2. So just, just a few little tweaks there just to be aware of. And I, you know, obviously I think they're, 
they're, they're very well welcomed and you know, important changes to the, to the classification system. Um, and we always used to say as well, if it's a, it invades the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, then it's a, uh, automatically a, a T4. Uh, but now this, we're saying depth of invasion supersedes that. Um, also to be aware that the T0 uh, is a, has been eliminated for everything apart from uh, HPV-associated and EBV-associated cancers of the head and neck. Uh, I also mentioned as well about extranodal extension. So this again changes uh, a little bit with regard to um, how the nodal system has been classified. And again, there are some slight tweaks to that nodal system as well. So uh, clinically, extranodal extension is, is, is quite difficult to categorize or classify because unless it is fairly extensive, i.e. skin involvement or involvement of local tissues with fixation of the node, then it's kind of late. But you may have macroscopic extranodal, and you're only really going to pick that up uh, on pathological examination later on. So if there's any doubt based on the pathology, then it should be extranodal uh, extension negative. Okay, so this is again just an example. Like I said, this is a pretty extreme example of a lymph node from left level 1B. This was a gentleman who had a, a very extensive uh, tongue, floor of mouth cancer with bilateral neck nodes. And these left level 1B lymph nodes had, had gone through the skin and had ulcerated through, so pretty extensive. And that's all fixed to that tissue. So you know, it doesn't take much to work out that that's got external extension, but that's just an example of it. Um, so like I said, the end staging's changed a little bit. I'm not going to go into it too much detail, but again, the ENE factor will upstage it significantly. And again, that wasn't something that was incorporated before. It's still N1, 2, and 3, but there's also a subclassification for N3 as well. But these are, again, just, just little changes that have been made just to make you kind of aware aware of those things as well. So like I said, um, N3A and N3B are t two new subsections of three. It wasn't split into two before, so just to kind of be aware of that as well. Um, and like I said, you're going to look pathologically whether you've got microscopic or macroscopic. And again, that's kind of just an academic point really just for the pathologist to, to, uh, to argue about whether it exists or not. Um, there's also the unknown primary as well, of which human HPV positive cancers are uh, quite a strong group of. And again, it's just to say where you've got a T0, uh, a T um, if it's N1, then it's a stage 3, N2, stage 4A, N3, it's a 4B. And if you've got any metastasis at all, it's a 4C. So just to be aware, these are the cancers where patients are going to come in and they've got a lymph node in their neck that just pops up and you're not sure where the primary site is. Okay, so this is kind of more pertinent to what we're talking about a little bit today. Um, this is the new specific classification for um, HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancers. So there is still the negative oropharyngeal cancers because they've got a different biology, and obviously, as we've discussed so far, we already recognize that. The T staging is basically the same as it was before. It's not, that's not really changed. That's not changed for an oral cancer. It's the way the TNM affects the overall staging later on. So um, again, this is kind of your appearance of something in the oropharynx on the, on the tonsillar fossa, on the left-hand side, left retromolar, extending back. And this is pretty extensive, really. So this would be your kind of classic appearance of something that was uh, an HPV, well, an oropharyngeal cancer. I can't say whether it's HPV positive or not based on that. Um, and then obviously the nodal classification as well. This is just simply one, two, and three. Uh, they haven't subclassified it into A's and B's, anything like that. So, again, just to be aware that that exists. Okay, and then they split that into pathology and clinical. So, this is the way that the, the staging, the TNM, affects the stage. Again, there's a lot of information on there, but I think probably if I could just you know, kind of draw your attention to the next slide, I would say this is probably, if I could say there's one slide that's kind of the take home from this, this whole presentation, this would be it. This was a patient that we saw relatively recently. So this patient's got a, uh, a PET scan here demonstrating that they've got an, an FDG avid uh, tonsillar cancer on the right-hand side. From this axial slide, you can see there's at least one lymph node involved there as well. You have to take my word for it that there were other lymph nodes as well of, uh, on that side. So um, based on, if you'd taken this patient on the 31st of December 2017, 
then they would have been a stage 4A cancer. But on the 1st of January 2018, this patient is a stage 1. So, you know, you, you know it's, it's just a total difference, a total sea change in how you're seeing these patients. And it really is quite radical what a difference that makes to, to that patient. And I think that's really important to, you know, ex accept and acknowledge that that is the new staging system and how these cancers behave well and how they have a good prognosis. So important to be aware of. Uh, so, again, as we've talked about already, these tend to be younger patients uh, affecting the oropharynx. They're pretty bulky disease early on. Uh, again, like I said, they can be from that unknown primary, males more than females, and importantly, improved survival as well. So, associated with um, sexual behavior, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that later on in, our, uh, in today's uh, presentations. Um, and tobacco and alcohol not associated with this. So, it's not, they, they will modify the disease, but they're not causative. Um, so just to be aware of other cancers, that there's a new staging system for head and neck sarcomas as well, just to be aware of, that's, that's been introduced into the eighth edition, uh, if that's something that uh, may be relevant to your practice as well. Uh, and again, they're mainly pathological differentiation between the different types of sarcomas, so just to be aware that that exists as well. Um, so just in, in summary, really, just to say, um, you know, there's this separate staging system for HPV-associated cancers, which is brand new, come out this year, so nice to be aware of that. Um, pharynx is still split into three, uh, three components, and, and also the depth of invasion being very important in and not just the, uh, the physical sort of size or quantity of the tumor that you can measure, the actual depth. And the only way to really know that is if you're going to either excise the lesion and you want to all take a representative biopsy right down through the core of the tumor. So that's going to give you a kind of depth of invasion. And also just to say, uh, extra nodal extension as well to be incorporated into the, uh, the nodal category. So um, that's it. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Much appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Idle. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Deepak Kadamani. He's an oral surgeon uh, who treats patients with head and neck cancer. He's also the medical director of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at North, as well as the fellowship director for head and neck oncologic surgery at North Memorial. Welcome, Dr. Kadamani. So um, my charge here for the next 20 minutes or so is to talk to you about some of the surgical management of the cancer patients that we see and tie it into the role um, so as we've already mentioned and you've already heard, um, oral and head and neck cancer is about the sixth most common cancer worldwide. It's about 3% of all the human malignancies that we see. Here in North America, we have about 50,000 new patients diagnosed every year, and about 10,000 of those patients will unfortunately die from their actual disease. The average age of diagnosis is about 62 years old. And as you've already heard, we have an increasing burdening population of younger patients that get diagnosed with head and neck cancer. This is um, completely changing in the social paradigm. We're seeing far younger people, more men, and we're also seeing celebrities that have brought attention to the tactical diagnosis. So this is the cancer that both Michael Douglas and also Roger Ebert um, unfortunately succumb from. And this is a global trend. We're seeing far more tum tumors now occurring across the world. Um, and, um, and this is not just occurring in North, in North America, this is occurring worldwide. When we look at these, about 90% of the tumors that we see are squamous cell carcinoma, and still today, unfortunately, in 2018, we see about 50% of patients still diagnosed with advanced stage disease. Um, the prognosis, as you've already heard, is very much predicated by stage. And we've seen some modest improvement, but by far and away, early stage patients, stage 1, T2, and, and T1, do significantly better than, our, than their counterparts in stage 3 and stage 4. And we have an average five-year survival of between 50 to 60%. That's seen some modest improvement over the last five year, over the last 30 years. Now, when we look at how we do as a health system and, and, and as a country across the world, we have significant disparities in the outcome between, for example, well-developed countries like North America and other parts of the world. 
Um, if you get diagnosed with a head and neck cancer, for example, in India, which has the number one rate of head and neck cancer of anywhere in the world, your survival is likely to be about 20% less than if you're managed here in, nor in North America. But when we look at this in a little bit more detail, what we see is patients with localized disease have uh, a significantly better outcome and prognosis with only about a 7% difference versus those with regional neck disease that need adjuvant treatment. So surgical management is very comparable, but when you add the need for radiation and for chemotherapy and the infrastructure needs that we need to be able to take care of these patients, that's when we start to see poor, poorer outcomes in this patient population. So as a worldwide population, we really need to de-escalate stage and then de-escalate treatment, which will help with morbidity and mortality from, from treatment. But you've already heard that cancer is a very, uh, it's very diverse. It's very diverse in terms of clinical presentation. But also what we see is that we have a lot of chromosomal changes that occur. We have a lot of genetic changes that occur. Um, and there is a histology section on there that's not showing up for some reason. But, um, but as cancers go through the precancer all the way through, through the actual malignant disease, we see these histologic changes paired with chromosomal changes and along with gene and their actual protein changes right there. Um, this is a classic paper that basically, that basically outlines the hallmarks of carcinogenesis, and you need all of these factors to occur, and we're only in the infancy of immune or therapy that are going to target some of these actual specific pathways. We know that EGFR, VEGF, and some other factors are just in the exploratory phase of pathways that we can use to target personalized treatment. So how novel would it be if you had a biopsy that our oral pathologist would be able to read? We could then run the patient through a battery of genetic tests. We could find out specifically if those patients were at high risk and if they needed aggressive therapy or not, regardless of the stage of the treatment. So in any type of uh, day, week, month, we kind of have this type of practice. We see a lot of patients with lumps, bumps, lesions in their mouth and in their neck from a, from, a, from a wide variety of backgrounds. Some of these lesions look very innocuous and some are obviously a malignancy. We know that um, medical and dental practitioners, which is why we wanted to put a conference like this on, um, are at the center point in terms of how these patients are, re are actually referred. And you've already heard from one of our patients that had an eight-year latency period in terms of having symptoms and a lesion before malignant transformation. And part of this is because of patient lack of awareness of what a symptom might be. However, many of these lesions are asymptomatic even when they, be, even when they become advanced stage. We have a lack of practitioner awareness in terms of what is a normal exam, in terms of a dental exam, an oropharyngeal exam, and therefore we have some delays in, in these patients being diagnosed, being biopsied, and being referred for definitive treatment. So we certainly need early detection methods, and we're working on that in terms of managing patients with pre-neoplastic conditions. Um, early detection and, and also risk factor aversion and trying to mitigate those dysplastic patients. And of every one cancer patient I see, I probably see 10 that have dysplasia. So we, uh, but I know that one or two of those patients, if we follow them long enough, will convert into having a malignancy. So we follow them for a long time and we have to educate them about the diagnosis. Um, for visible lesions, and then visible exam and clinical exam is key, but we need some better adjuncts uh, with better sensitivity and specificity to be able to diagnose these patients. The American Head and Neck Society basically recommends that clinical examination is the only and also recommended method for screening patients. There's no actual adjuncts that have been proven now that have been effective. Now, um, my children could tell you that there is something wrong here. Um, However, uh, we still see patients like this on a routine basis that present with advanced stage disease. Um, and this is Jill. I asked her if I could show her slides, and this is from 12 years ago. Jill was 38 years old, had four kids, and came in with her 
with, with her actual husband. She, as she already mentioned, she had an early stage tongue cancer, um, but by the time she presented, she had palpable neck disease. Um, she underwent a glossectomy. She underwent a neck dissection, reconstruction with a radial forearm free flap. Um, because of neck disease, uh, with the presence of extra nodal extension, as you heard about from Dr. I. Idol, she received radiation and, key and chemotherapy. Um, State-of-the-art treatment, and she's done exceptionally well. But that's not to say that she's not had some challenges. As she's already mentioned, she can't eat all the things that you, that you can. She has to go and see the dentist and the hygienist on a much more frequent basis because of the, because of the radiation and the effect that that has on, on her actual dentition. <clears throat> and here she is now. And, this, and these are the slides that tell you that she looks much better than I do over this period of time. So, can, so cancer progression. So we want to be able to treat cancers when they're localized and small. We want to avoid the presence of neck disease. And of course, we don't, of course we don't want to see patients when they present to us that have, that have distant disease. Pre-cancer is also an area with chemo prevention and early detection that we need to work on as well. The challenge that we have is that we have very unpredictable levels of biologic behavior. We can't tell of all of these patients that we see that have white patches and red patches and dysplasia, which ones of those patients are going to convert into cancer. We know that one or two um, out of 10 will, between 10 to 20 to 20 percent, but we don't know when. And, and we don't know what, the, what those factors are that, that will encourage it. As part, as part of oncologic treatment, it's critical to understand that elective neck dissection in all of our patients is key. Um, in doing neck dissections, we improve patients' survival by about 36%, which is why all patients that have head and neck cancer should have the neck interrogated um, because it's a very important step in terms of improving the prognosis of these patients. As you heard from Dr. Andre, we've seen about a 6% rate of increase of diagnosis of head and neck cancer, predominantly in people under the age of 40. I've already shown you these slides, and we've seen that cancer diagnosis here in Minnesota from 2000 has gone up progressively, as it has done in the rest of the country and also the rest of the world. This is an interesting slide because this is the reason why we're all here. Because when we look at the stage of diagnosis and they are diagnosed in either dental offices or primary medical offices, I almost never see an early stage cancer patient that's being referred to me by a medical practitioner. The only times I get referred a cancer patient from a medical practitioner is when they have neck disease. Um, so they have an oropharyngeal oral cavity cancer and they have a bump in the neck, which is the reason why their patient goes to see the primary care physician or pediatrician or OB in the first place. Whereas on the dental side, we tend to see patients that have earlier stage disease. These are patients that have T1 and T2 lesions. Um, and so there is that difference in terms of how the professions interface in this actual diagnosis and how these patients are seen. You've already heard a lot about the biology of of actually HPV, and we know that HPV positivity is a, is a good prognostic feature. And patients that have HPV positive cancers have an 80% five-year survival versus only 20% if you are, have a HPV negative cancer. So it's a very, uh, very actual positive feature. And these are the same virus strains that cause cervical cancer, 16, 18, and 31. Maura Gillison at, uh, at John Hopkins in 2010 was the first person to really identify the, the association between HPV and head and neck cancer, and now it has become an independent risk factor for head and neck cancer. So as the rates of oropharyngeal cancer go up, um, the rates in general of oral cavity cancer slightly go down, but it is something that we need to work on. Now, um, in 2009, the FDA approved robotic surgery for T1, T2 malignant tumors of the oral cavity, oropharynx, and larynx. Um, and this is an example of what a patient undergoes when they have robotic tonsil car carcinoma sur sur surgery. So you can see here. Um, do I need to click this to play the video? Or thank you. So th this is an example of what that actually looks like. You're at an independent console and you've got the haptic hands and you can get 
and you can gain access to the oropharynx, the base of the tongue, and all these locations um, in an easier way um, than doing it directly. Some of the benefits, if we could just advance the slide, and then some of the benefits um, of doing a robotic-assisted surgery is that we don't have to open the facial skeleton to get back into the oropharynx. So we don't have to do a lip split mandibulotomy. We have shorter times for surgery, decreased tracheostomy rate, decreased peg tube dependency rate, and earlier return of oral function, um, and less hospitalization. All factors that decrease the cost of care. But oral cavity cancers are much more amenable to surgery and should be managed with surgery first rather than chemo radiation, unlike the oropharyngeal cancers. And, and, and this is an example of a patient that has a relatively routine panorex. If you looked at this panorex, you would probably say it looked okay. However, he has a large buccal mucosal retromole tri trigone cancer, erosion into the maxilla, erosion into the mandible. Um, so clinical exam, regardless of the radiology films that we have in our dental offices, is going to be key to be able to diagnose these patients. So um, we're able nowadays to have very sophisticated reconstructionist actual techniques, particularly when the bone and the soft tissue is involved, and we're able to plan exactly how much bone we, re we need to remove and how we can plan this in terms of our plates and our reconstruction so we can get as close to near normal function. I, and we tell patients it's going to be a year or two, but the goal is you'll be able to go out for dinner and you'll be able to socially interact and have very minimal um, um, you know, social consequences from your, from your actual disease. So, that, so the same patient undergoes an open tube resection, so lip split, man, mandibulotomy. So just to orientate you, I'm not sure if there's a highlighter here. I'll try, but um, no. So, um, so the top there on the left-hand side is the nose, is the, um, um, and is the a, is a skull. Yeah, if you have one right there. Okay, great. So you've got the, um, so you've got the head here. Sorry, you've got the feet down here, you've got the nose, this is the maxilla and the maxillary teeth, you've got the, you've got the retromolar trigone that's been cleared out with a mandibulotomy here and also a nectar section here. Uh, and this is the resection specimen in continuity here with a nectar section, um, undergoes a scapular free flap for reconstruction which allows us to not only reconstruct the bone but also the soft tissue at the same time, post-operative panorex radiograph, uh, post-operative CT scan, and here's the patient about three months after surgery, as, and then has also subsubsequently undergone some soft tissue revision is doing well. But again, high-risk disease undergoes chemo ra radiation, and so it's very important for us to be able to keep a, a close eye on these, on, on these patients. <clears throat> I've already mentioned that we have now the beginning of immunotherapy, and Herbitux Cetuximab has been, has been FDA approved for head and neck cancer. Actually, the trial that Jill had 12 years ago was one of the first trials where she had cetuximab. Um, and by, by design, this improve, improves the survival rate by approximately 11% and improves the responsiveness to radiotherapy when we use these EGFR inhibitors. IMRT is something that is also used now, intensely modulated ray radiotherapy, to be able to mitigate those risks of conformal ray radiotherapy techniques. So the salivary structures, so the actual structures that we want to keep, uh, um, tend to uh, be able to receive less radiation. So the future really needs us as a community, both medical and dental practitioners, um, advanced practitioners, hygienists, um, all of us to be able to um, do thorough clinical exams, be able to localize disease in the early stage um, before patients get re-regional neck metastasis and, all, and also distant metastasis. There's a lot of work and research that needs to be done in how we manage pre-neoplastic conditions, and immunotherapy and chemo prevention will certainly play a role in that. So in conclusion, Oral cavity cancers are pretty much managed with surgery. They tend to have a low rate of, of HPV infection, around about 10%, and surgery is the mainstay of treatment. 
Nectar section is a, is a critical feature of improving patient outcomes and is, a, and is a standard of care for all patients that get diagnosed with head and neck cancer. Late stage tumors need to be managed with radiation and chemotherapy when indicated, and you've, heard, and you've already heard how the staging characteristics of all of these tumors have, have actually changed greatly now. Oropharyngeal cancers, on the other hand, are markedly different. 80% of them are HPV positive. Most of them are managed with chemo radiotherapy first with surgery for salvage. Robotic resection in selected patients is certainly an option. Um, and targeted immunotherapy is certainly in its, in its infancy and we'll be hearing a lot more of this as we, as we go on to the future. I think as practitioners, stage de-escalation, therapeutic de-escalation, uh, and decreasing morbidity and mortality are going to be key, which will also improve the cost of care that we deliver to our patients too. So I'd like to thank you, um, and um, we'll wait for, until the end of the section to have any questions. Thank you very much. Okay. And with that, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Brooke, to come and say a few words. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I just, I'm really happy to be able to share my story with all of you. Um, my story actually starts um, almost four years to the date. Um, in the spring of 2014, I was 26 years old, um, and brushing my teeth one day, I noticed these couple of white spots under my tongue. Um, didn't really have any pain or any other symptoms, really, so it didn't worry me all that much. Um, I knew I had a dentist appointment coming up in May, so just kind of put it off until then. Um, I went to my dentist appointment. I've always been very diligent about every six months, brush your teeth twice a day, all of that good stuff. But um, when I did go to my dentist, um, he said, you know, it's probably nothing. I don't have a family history of oral cancer. I've never been a tobacco user of any kind. Um, I enjoy my glass of wine here and there, but certainly not the half a bottle to bottle a day that they were talking about earlier. Um, so really not a ton of risk factors for me, um, and especially considering my age. Um, that said, I had to have a wisdom tooth pulled anyway, so he referred me to um, an oral surgeon who could do the wisdom tooth and the biopsy all at the same time. Um, so really not, not a huge deal for me. Um, I went in and I had that done in June of 2014. Um, it was a quick procedure. It was the first time I'd ever been put under for anything, so I was a little, little laughy afterwards. but. Um, really super easy recovery, mild pain reliever is not a big deal. Again, I just, I really wasn't that worried um, about what the outcome was going to be. Um, when he called me with the results from the biopsy, at that point, the section they had taken was precancerous. Um, so that is when I was referred to Dr. Kadamani and his team, and I set up a consultation. Um, again, no one was it, it was urgent, but it wasn't as scary as it could have been for sure, um, because at this point we were under the assumption that it was all precancerous and that we'd, we'd gotten ahead of it. Um, so we set up my uh, first surgery uh, for August 28th, um, bright and early in the morning. Um, it was my first ever real surgical procedure, uh, so I was, yeah, as I got closer, definitely very, very nervous. Um, but went in, made it through surgery. Um, the first couple days weren't too bad, you know, had some soup, some ice cream, things like that. Um, but in that initial surgery, um, it was left as an open wound, so kind of as that anesthetic started to wear off, it, it got really, really painful. Um, it was to the point that I was really only able to consume room temperature water because anything with any salt or anything like that obviously felt awful. Uh, so combined with the pain meds and the water diet, it was, a, it was a rough couple of weeks, but, you know, kind of still in that mentality of, well, we were ahead of it, we're good, we're just going to move on. Um, then I got a call, and he said, you know what, we've got your pathology back, can you come in? Maybe you want to bring your mom or a loved one. So uh, it got a little scarier because, you know, they don't ask you to come in if everything's clear. <laughs> So um, I went back in, and it had turned out that there was a small term tumor, um, stage one uh, squamous cell carcinoma, in the spot that they'd removed. 
Um, so our plan of action at that point was to schedule an additional surgery as soon as possible um, to do a wider margin around that same area in my tongue and then do the neck dissection that he was talking about, um, which went really well. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so we scheduled that one. That was on September 25th. Um, so, again, this is all happening in the span of just a very few short months. Um, so I went in for my second surgery in September of 2014. They did, um, like I said, the wider margin. So all said and done, missing just under a third of my tongue. Um, but they did such, such a great job. Um, my scar is barely visible. Most people don't notice it unless I point it out. Um, and uh, every, everything went really well with surgery. That was my first stay in a hospital ever. Um, they all treated me very well. But I ha all said and done took about, off about a month of work after that additional surgery, just because it's more invasive and the recovery time with the neck dissection was a lot longer um, than with just the initial surgery. Um, since then, though, uh, it's been, like I said, coming up on four years. So I've had all good, clean scans since then, um, no further symptoms. I still hear myself lisp a little, but most people don't. So, you know, I had a little bit of speech therapy um, and a little bit of physical therapy following those surgeries, but I, I honestly couldn't be happier with the outcome of it. Um, honestly, I owe everything to early detection um, and just the sense of urgency and care that I was shown um, by Dr. Kadamani and his team. Um, every single one of them has just been so compassionate and just genuinely concerned and just, you know, really cared about the outcome. Um, I've just never experienced that level of care from any other medical team that I've ever dealt with. Um, and I'm so grateful that I was referred to him and his team because it just, it changed everything for me. Um, and I continue to uh, have gratitude for that every single day. That story, I really appreciate it. Um, it's always heartwarming to hear it from patients because uh, I think in the, as surgeons and healthcare practitioners, we get very immune sometimes to, you know, what we do. But on every diagnosis, there is a person, a spouse, a family member, um, and we have to always be uh, actually very mindful of that. Um, so I'd like to just open the floor to some questions for the first group of, of speakers, we've heard about um, how, you know, the current state in terms of how we manage patients with, with cancer. For the clinicians on the panel, um, that have, you've thought about this a lot, what can we do besides a conference like this to close the gap uh, between medical clinicians and dental clinicians on this issue? Yeah, this is something that we've looked at a lot of times for things within the context of screening for my cancer prevention clinical trials at the U. What we seem to think is that when we have these sort of conferences where we increase the awareness of the dental community, and there's other people here too, that, that the first line people who are going to see a lot of these lesions are not often the family practice doctor. A lot of times they're hygienists, they're dentists. So uh, I'm, I'm faculty at the dental school, too, so we've made maneuvers in the state of Minnesota to try and, uh, and allow for that to occur. There were, um, there have been, the, back in the early 60s, the city of Chicago, for several years, ran something through the ADA. And as long as it was like garden-like, making sure there were no weeds popping up, and they had billboard campaigns, and it's excessively expensive, expensive kind of stuff, when they did that, things seemed to be pretty good in the system. I, I went back through a bunch of 50-year-old archive material at the University of Illinois Dental School once to look at this. But I think that, um, you know, we, we, everyone knows, you know, there's, there's maybe even self-exams. I think that in our precancerous lesion practice, we have between 500 and 1,000 patients that we keep on uh, active surveillance at the U between the dental school and myself, and we kind of keep patients educated we kind of tell, I've, I've, I've had patients who are friends of patients that have come with actual oral cancers and things. So I think those kind of things help. I think the ADA had a teaching set about 10 years ago that Dr. Rodas at the U was uh, working on. That was a good thing. But the main difficulty ends up being that, um, that and, and I've had this issue at Health Partners where there's a lot of Health Partners dentists, right? So 
there's not a harmonization of dental and medical insurance, and there's not a harmonization of the way that people are paid for different types of things. So as an oral surgeon, one will bill some, some of that through what would be the medical system, but the rest of it goes through dental insurance. So that part of the system is very complex, and I don't know that, that that's, going to be, that's not going to be trivial to change. So that's kind of my, my take on this. What I can say is that we went on our first trial from screening 279 patients to get one on a clinical trial. Now we're able to get about 90% patients enrolled because of our active surveillance practice for our cancer prevention clinical trials that we do at the National Cancer Institute. So we, we think we're able to garner these folks in, but it's, it's a lot of effort. I think that um, when we're talking about bringing in all the different providers into, into having so-called a joint collaboration, we've done this, we used to do this at the university as well, when we used to have joint tumor boards, and, and that's really helped because that exposes not, we used to have the, the, you know, the dentists come to those tumor board conferences ourselves who are also treating head and neck cancer patients, and then the otolaryngologists are also treating them as well. So when these discussions are held in a joint fashion, then, you know, it keeps everybody humble and it standardizes everything. So that's, I feel like that's really helped us in, in terms of bringing the two teams together. I think just going on to Frank's point, I think that one of the key things that we need to work on as a community is to have better integration of medical and dental insurance and also coverage. Um, we know that um, in, the, in the slides that I showed in, ter in terms of access and how patients are diagnosed, it's those advanced stage cancers really come from the primary care physicians, whereas the dentists seem to see the smaller stage uh, T1 and T2 cancers, that's pretty typical. Um, and so that is something as a communi community I think we need to work on a little bit. Other than early detection uh, for cancer, what is the most critical thing that you feel is important for uh, a good survival rate in, in your treatment? Um, I'll just answer that first, you know, I think that probably the most important treatment that the patients get first is going to predicate how they do. So if they get contemporary standard of care therapy first, that, um, that bodes significantly better. It's far more difficult to manage a patient that gets a recurrence or um, is, non is, or is non-compliant with the complete therapy that they have, um, and they tend to have a lot of trouble. And the patients that we tend to lose are those who don't complete all of their treatment. But the first treatment that those patients get is the key between um, a good prognosis and a bad prognosis. Yeah, the, um, you know, back to my very first, before my first slide, but a multidisciplinary care team has been shown for multiple solid tumor malignancies to improve survival. And, um, and in the state of Minnesota, we have better head and neck cancer survival than the rest of the country, at least on average. And we've had multidisciplinary care teams and tumor conferences at all the hospital systems for like 25 years or more, okay? Um, and chemotherapy was sort of invented by B.J. Kennedy, who was a university professor. So we've had a long history of this. Deepak is exactly right. When you, when you have a person undergoing, undergoing care in a multidisciplinary setting, every, no one's more than a phone call away than saying, it's like, look, you know, do you think we're going to be able to get this person through their third cycle of platinum, they're looking pretty rough. You know, what can we do about that? So that communication, you know, when, whenever the care is given as the standards that have been put out there, the outcome's always better. And, uh, and particularly of note is in larynx cancer. Larynx cancer right now has about a 3% lower survival rate than when I was in high school, okay? And part of the problem with that is, is that in those days, there was a lot of earlier disease that got total laryngectomies. And nowadays what happens is that not everyone will get all 35 treatments of radiation. If they have early stage, they may not get that third cycle of chemotherapy because someone's worried that they're going to need a tracheostomy or something like that. So that, I think, is uh, like a little bit of a litmus test to show you that when things are brought through our multidisciplinary care teams that the outcome is going to be better, survival is going to be better. The detection part, which Deepak mentioned as well, as soon as you... Is, as soon as you, and I read this in an article that you wrote, but you know, we all know this, as soon as you have a palpable lymph node, survival goes down by 20% all sites, okay? So any of these things that we do, whether it's the busy light and people are at least looking, there's going to be stage migration. 
but that has to be studied. There's not great resources to study that, even at the National Institute of Dental Research and things like that. So it, it's, the data is going to be hard to come by to know that we're doing as much better as we probably are in certain organ sites. We, we probably have time for another one or two questions at the most. So. Hi, I'm a pediatrician, and I do agree with all of you. you know, as providers, we probably have not been paying much attention to the oral health, but that trend seems to be changing, and we are starting to educate our patients and parents more on oral health, taking care of going to the dentist, the problem of insurance you already brought in, which is a major issue. Most of our patients below five years of age, they don't have a dental insurance, even older than that. And the public health offices, like I come from, I practice at Mayo Clinic, and our county does have dental hygienists coming to the county offices twice a month doing general examination, and I think we are trying to work on that process of improving the care and making the appropriate referral. My next question is on HPV, and I'm a director of uh, immunization program at Austin Mayo Clinic Health System. So is there any communication among the dental offices to start offering HPV vaccine? Because we know from our last 10 years experience that HPV has helped tremendously to decrease the incidence of cervical cancer. So is there any progress and talks on that issue? That's a great question, and the answer to that is yes. So the American Dental Association has got a position paper that's soon going to be published, if it hasn't been already, to advocate that dental practitioners and specialists are in a position to provide the HPV vaccine. Um, this, however, is going to a community of practitioners that is not used to providing the ability to vaccinate, so there's lots of logistical things that dental practitioners will need to overcome if they're going to be able to provide vaccination, and part of it is why we have conferences like this to educate. Um, but, you know, those, those patient interactions are going to open the window to be able to do that. I'm just wondering, um, we're in the dental profession, um, and if the screening is so important, how come the dental insurance plans are not covering the dental screenings for us like they do for pap smears and other um, cancer screenings? Why are they not covering um, for dental screenings? And is the Velscope a good choice of helping to, um, with that screening? Um, I'll just say a few words and then pass it along. But I think, you know, that's a difficult problem, partly because, um, and we have the COO, obviously, of Delta Dental right here. But, um, um, but not to put him on the hot spot. However, <laughs> however, however, yeah, he, he can't leave. Um, however, I do think that um, we are not at the stage that we have reliable tests right now. Um, that are out there. Um, and so the sensitivity and specificity of a lot of the scre screening techniques are not particularly validated. And when we have this rush of new technology that comes out, um, we, we as tertiary referral practitioners often see patients that have completely normal exams but have a positive test. And so therefore it creates a lot of anxiety in patients, adds to the cost of care. So I think until we get to that point that we can um, have reliable tests like we do for cervical cancer. Um, we are not there yet, but for, for, I have two valve scopes, but I, I use them to um, for to guide margin resection on people who have had been outside. They've been resected. There's microscopic margins. I'll let their mouth heal up, and then I'll use the autofluorescence scope to guide how I resect in the OR. I think that the payment thing of screening is, is interesting. I, I don't, I, and I, I would almost leave it up to uh, the individual practitioners. Or if you look at the time that you have to spend for a hygienist appointment or a dental appointment, is there, an, you know, is it? Can you do a good? If, if you have a 20-minute visit, can you do a 30-second screening exam of a mouth? And I think that the answer might be yes. I mean, when, I, when I'm screening and I'm trying to, I, I have a headlight on, 
I, I, don't, I use two tongue blades because I have two hands with a headlight on. You guys have better headlights than we have in clinic generally. So I, and I could probably, and I'm, I'm able to do an adequate screening exam on my patients who come in just for that in probably about a minute or so. So when it comes to, um, when it, and so how much should I be paid for a minute of my time, I guess, right? So, so, so that's how I kind of like fold it into it because we want to be able to compartmentalize what we do for our services. We want to get paid for all those things. But if a person could do something that's going to be potentially life-saving that doesn't really take that much more time, then I guess I don't put the cost of my time into that as much. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we've come to the, I think, the joyful section of the, of the session today. Uh, we have uh, three great speakers before we go to our breakout sessions. One of them is me, so, you know. Uh, anyways, uh, we want to let you know that all of our speakers uh, disclosed that they have, that none of them have a financial relationship or anything to disclose. Uh, that was one of those or original slides from Dr. Kadamani that got lost um, our next speaker is Margie Hogan. Dr. Hogan is a pediatrician and an adolescent medicine specialist and has been doing so for 38 years. She's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. She has a very busy clinical practice, serving dedicated patient families, some of whom she's treated multiple generations of. She also wants you to know that she survived raising her own four adolescents as well. Welcome, Margie Hogan. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here to talk about really my favorite subject, except for talking about babies. But today, today we're doing adolescence, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this, you're, you already know this, but I thought I would use this as an opportunity to say that the people in the slides, some of them are my children, and they have given me assent to use their photos. They think it's sort of amusing. And many are my patients, and they've also given their consent for me to use their photos. This is a slide of just a bunch of lovely teenagers so that you can see the different moods, the different looks, the different attitudes that teenagers bring to our lives. And um, I hope you'll find the same joy in them that, that I do. First of all, what is an adolescent? There are many different definitions, and I think probably you know, they're, not little, they're not big children, they're not little adults, they're somewhere in between. In our clinic, we use a definition of between the ages of 11 and 22 to be seen in our adolescent clinic. It's the time when puberty happens and, and teenagers move from, again, childhood into the adult world. We also can talk about the different skills that adolescents need to um, complete in order to make it to adulthood, and that's another way to look at adolescents. They form identity, they have future orientation, all sorts of skills. Why I care for adolescents, I think I've made clear, I find them just a, a joyful group to work with. Not always easy, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but I think that they really keep us humble, they keep us honest, and they're the next generation, so what could be more important? Pediatricians and other primary care providers of adolescents play a really important role in adolescent health. We are there when they're making important health choices that will follow them into adulthood. How many 30-year-olds wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll start smoking cigarettes today? Not many, but 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds are experimenting with some of those very, um, the very crucial choices. So we're there when children and adolescents are making some of health decisions that will inform them throughout their lives. There are challenges in adolescent health care, and I choose to tell you today that it's a balance of joy and managing the challenges. Normative adolescent development and behavior is, there, it's a continuum, and most adolescents move along that continuum fairly predictably, but not all do. The challenge is that adolescents have risk-taking behaviors, they're trying to decide their identity, who they are, and, and we're there for that, for that ride. The family is often a challenge when taking care of adolescents. I have to say very honestly that most of my patients have good relationships with their parents, but some children and adolescents are not so lucky, and that's something that we as pediatricians and other providers have to realize, that we sometimes 
are a stabilizing force in the lives of adolescents and young adults. Also, confidentiality and consent. I'm sure all of you know about this conundrum in pediatric practice, that the right for confidential care and the right to consent for certain parts of care are statute protected for adolescents. And that's another challenge that we have to navigate along the way as, as providers. So how do we approach a teenage patient? First of all, it depends on the developmental stage. I don't approach an 11 or 12 year old the same way I would approach an 18 year old. With an 11 year old, we're talking much more about the here and now, what are their activities, tell me about your friends. Whereas with an older teen, we can talk about the future. What do you want to do after you graduate from high school? You know, what are, what are your aspirations? The younger teens don't really have a good grip on the future yet. It's pretty much what's happening to me today. Another important part of the approach to the teen patient is to really value them, to enjoy them, to like them. I've seen people in my clinic who know they have a teenager waiting in room 22 to go, oh my God, it's a teenager. What am I going to do? As opposed to walking in and, and enjoying the, the experience. So they have really good radar to know if the provider likes them and values them. I think it's important as much as possible to be non-judgmental about teenagers. We'll talk more about the challenges, but to really go into that room, whether you're a dental provider or a medical provider, and, and be ready to listen and be respectful and non-judgmental. Listen is a word that I want to stress. So often there's a message that an adolescent is trying to get across to us, and we have to be in the position to be listening for what they're really trying to tell us. It's a window of opportunity. And I thought about this, planning for the talk, talking to Jenny, who we're doing the breakout session with later, that a dental hygienist, a nurse, the people who are, who are there with kids are in a perfect place, a window of opportunity to listen and to reflect back to kids. Like being a mother driving in the car with your kids in the back seat, they have nowhere to go, right? So it's a window of opportunity. I don't know how many of you have heard of the HEADS concept. HEADS is an acronym that we in pediatrics use to construct a conversation with an adolescent. And let me explain that for a moment. And other pediatricians in the audience are rolling their eyes saying, where did you get all those Ds and Ss? But I'll explain what that means. Every time we see a teenager, we should use it as an opportunity to talk about all the domains in their life. Now, with patients I know well and have known well for you know, 15 years, I don't have to ask them about their family structure every time or what school they go to. But this is a way for us to really remember that a teenager's life is very complicated and has many moving parts. H, home. E, education, employment. A, activities, including sleep, sports, friends, that kind of thing. My three Ds, number one, drugs and alcohol. We've heard about that quite a bit today. The next D, I use diet. One of the epidemics in pediatric medicine today is obesity. And that's, I find that that's just a key part of my discussion with teenagers. And the last D, depression and suicide. Again, another major risk factor in adolescent lives today. The three S's, I use S for safety including guns, including violence, including using a seatbelt in the car, and so on. The second S, sex, we're coming to that. And the last S, screen time. And that's my own addition, but I really feel strongly that that's an important part of adolescent health today. So when I'm doing this discussion with teenagers in my clinic, I always talk to the parent first, if they're available, talk to the parent and teen together, and then I excuse the parent and say, goodbye, I'm going to have some time alone with your teenager now and we'll, we'll get together after. And that's a very key part of adolescent health care. For an 11-year-old, a parent might say or the child might say, I don't want mom to leave, and I'll say, that's fine, that's fine. But for most teenagers, that private time with your provider is absolutely key. It's practice for adult life. And it's a time where you can establish a real trust relationship with that young person. 
then addressing these domains, and again, I don't, I don't go over every single one of these every single visit, but it's in my head. You know, what's going on in this kid's life? You start broad. You know, how's school? What's your favorite class? Do you have friends at school? And then you can start to dig in a little bit more. Ooh, you're not getting very good grades. What's, you know, what's going on? And you, and you move from the general to the specific. This also obtains for the very sensitive issues, like drug use, like sexual behavior, like carrying a gun. I mean, you start broad and you narrow it. This can also normalize some very sensitive issues. If I'm asking about family and I'm asking about diet and I'm asking about school, then I move on to asking about sexuality, sexual orientation, safe behavior, and so on. So this HEADS construct I think is very, very important in, in the pediatric or primary care provider's office. It's also a time to identify kids who have risk. You know, kids I'm, I'm concerned about, and kids who are resilient, kids who bring up some really scary things like, you know, I don't have much support at home. You know, I, sometimes I can't get to school because I have to take care of the younger kids, but I'm determined. I mean, you identify resilience, resiliency factors, which is very important. S, for sex and sexuality. This has to start in childhood when we talk about sex and sexuality with families. We talk to parents with babies about how babies tend to touch their genitalia. That's normal. It feels good. That's sexuality for the infant. And that continues throughout the child's life. You talk about privacy in the home. You talk about pubertal changes. All of these very, very normal parts of growing up. It's part of the big F discussion but it's tailored for age. We know that issues of gender identity, gender fluidity, gender dysphoria, sexual orientation, these are big issues for kids and teens now. And thank heavens in 2018 we can talk about some of these things openly. This is something else that the provider has to be very willing to listen actively and to explore. We talk about safety in terms of sexuality. And another thing, moving back to younger childhood, encouraging parents to talk to children about their body parts, about who can touch them, who can see them. That's all safety that starts in childhood and moves all the way through adolescence into adulthood. And through all of this, we, try, we maintain that non-judgmental, open-ended questioning, active listening attitude. This is all normal stuff, and everybody goes through it in their own way. The kinds of questions that I would encourage all of us to ask are questions like this, open-ended questions. We don't go into the room with an agenda, but we listen to see what's coming back at us. So I might say, any of your friends talking about having periods? You know, what do you know about that? Have you talked to your parent? Are you having, no, and so you, I'm moving from the general to the more specific. Sometimes kids your age wonder about the changes going on in your body. What have you noticed? You know, do you have any concerns about the changes going on in your body? To an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old, a 12-year-old girl who's this tall, and all the boys are this tall, and they're trying to make sense of what's going on with me. And that's a, that's a big deal. They may not ask that question, but you have to be the active listener. Are you comfortable with your body? Um, do you like who you are? And, you know, a lot of these... You'll ask it in your own way, but you're trying to get to the heart of the matter. You know, what's on your mind? And then, of course, some of the more scary questions. And have you ever been touched or threatened sexually? Has anyone ever touched you in a way you didn't like? That's not the first question you ask, but it comes out of the conversation. And then we move into the more specific questions about sexual activity and sexual behavior. And again, done in a, a setting of confidentiality, respect, open listening, and, and, and just mutuality. Do you ever think about having sex? Have you talked to your friends about what that means? And finally, you know, have you had sexual activity? The other day I had an interesting encounter. I, had a, I was with a boy, he, I think he was 14 or 15, and he was very uncomfortable with this. And I had to try to figure out, okay, 
And I said, you know, have you had sex before? He went, yeah. I said he was just agitated. And I said, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And he said, I, I'm compelled to touch myself. I can't stop. It feels, you know, and he was talking about very normative adolescent male sexual behavior. And, and I could reassure him and say, that's normal. That's, that's hormonal. That's part of, you know, who, who adolescents are. And so asking the questions, and, and if I said, are you sexually active? And he went, yes, I would, have, I would have missed what he was trying to tell me. And so, again, active listening. And as we've spoken about a little bit earlier in some of the other talks, there are risk behaviors that um, make STDs more likely, that raise our antenna as far as risky outcomes for kids, whether it's STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, or STIs, sexually transmitted infections, or pregnancy. And it really is the primary care provider's role to talk about safe sexual practice, including affirming abstinence choices for kids. And that's, that's you know, a very appropriate choice, and it's our role to affirm, but to also talk about safe sexual practices, making sure teens, and I say that to my, my teens. I say, why do you think I'm asking you these questions? And they'll sort of say, I don't know. And I'll say, because I want to make sure you're safe. I want to make sure you're healthy. And, and they, they get that. This slide, I just have to explain it. I was in Montana at Yellowstone Park, in January, um, and I went into a restaurant, and in the bathroom is this basket of, of condoms, but also some wonderful literature for kids about safe sexual practices, about abstinence, but it was just, it was amazing. It was, it was in a time where there were lots of young skiers and snowboarders out where I was, and there it was, you know, just in the bathroom right there to educate kids. It's really important for us to have our antenna up about risky sexual behavior and to be very open and direct about talking about this. Teens pick up right away if you're not direct with them or if you're judging them or if you have preconceived notions. But some of the risky behaviors that make a teen more at risk for sexually transmitted infections or unwanted pregnancy include early sexual debut. And we should be asking our youngest teens these very, very hard questions. Teens who have multiple partners, multiple sexual partners, again, raises concern about um, bad outcomes for them. And specifically for HPV infection, oral sex, deep kissing, being able to ask candidly about different sexual practices that kids have. And you've established your ability to ask these questions because of the rest of your interview. You're just moving into a different territory. There are comorbid risks with sexual activity that, that we should also be aware of and be able to talk about. And that includes teens with known depression, um, teens who use substances, um, we've talked about HPV and smoking and drinking before, or oral cancers, but specifically smoking and HPV is, is a concern. In Minnesota, we have a real identified problem with trafficking of, of young people sexually. And if you are a primary care provider, again, having it on your radar that this might be a young person you're seeing. Are there frequent visits for sexually transmitted infection testing? Is there something not quite right about the answers that you're hearing that you need to explore further? And finally, I wanted to mention the adolescent brain because we can't do this discussion without it. It is a risk factor. The adolescent brain is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we used to think that the brain was sort of done, you know, at a much earlier age. But we know now that the brain continues to mature and develop with elaboration of neurons and axons and connections well into young adulthood. And we have to remember that adolescents are on a continuum of this development. For many young people, the prefrontal cortex is just, you know, a future dream during adolescence when they're making big decisions about things. And there's a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is, you know, the impulse and let's do it now, that's very active. And we can see that on, on radiographic studies. So remember that the adolescent brain, it's part of all this. 
it's a wonderful creation, but it's, it's a work in progress. It's an evolution. There is good news. We really do under, can understand much of teen behavior just thinking about the adolescent brain, about normative things, about pushing back against authority, which is a normal thing, about risk-taking behavior, which is a very common and normative thing, peers being the ascendant force in a child's life as opposed to adults. This is all, this is all we, we see it all the time. We can understand a lot of the behaviors that we, that we hear about in our clinic and office. There is a trend that sexual behavior, there are fewer, fewer sexually active teens in the U.S. when surveyed in large studies. There are fewer adolescent pregnancies. STDs are still a major problem. And HPV would be one of those, chlamydia, you know, the, the whole thing. We'll talk more about HPV vaccine and how important that is, but it's still a problem. Teens and um, learn about sex and sexuality, not enough from their health providers and their parents. They get a, one study showed that the vast majority of teens learn about sexuality and sexual behavior from the media. So that's something to keep in our minds and from their peers. What can dentists and dental hygienists do? First of all, and we'll talk much more about this coming up this, this afternoon, but to open the conversation with young people in the dental chair, whether you're a hygienist or a dentist, about how important oral health is, um, that your mouth is an important part of your body, and what is HPV and why do we care as dentists and hygienists? We, you should be ready and confident to answer questions that teens will undoubtedly pose to you. We'll talk much more about the HPV vaccine with my friends coming up after me, but recommend the HPV vaccine very openly and, and positively. And if comfortable, safe sex always is a good thing to remind people about. I want to leave you with just four thoughts, and that is that I'm so excited about the possibility of health providers, both medical and dental, working together as a team to ensure better health for teenagers. We can reinforce the same messages about safety, about the HPV vaccine, and just about how much we care about teens. We have a window of opportunity, whether they're in the dental chair or in our office, to give some of these messages. And I encourage you to enjoy caring for the teens that you encounter in your practices. Thank you very much. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eileen Crespo. I'm a pediatrician uh, at Hennepin Healthcare, and I'm also the Vice President of Medical Services at Delta Dental. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the HPV vaccine. I, I did remember to put my slide in. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, broadly about uh, the, HPV, the HPV vaccine uh, and its uh, role and how it actually started. So uh, you'll see here uh, that the HPV vaccine was approved uh, in 2006. It was initially only approved for females. Uh, subsequent to that, in 2009, the uh, indications from the FDA were expanded to include males. Uh, that same year, there was uh, approval of another vaccine, which was uh, the two-valent vaccine, which only covered HPV type 16 and 18, which you guys have heard about today. Uh, although, sorry, and I skipped over that the first vaccine approved uh, uh, covered four types, 16, 18, 6, and 11. Uh, for those of you uh, in the audience who knows, we talked about 16 and 18. 6 and 11 are the predominant types uh, associated with warts, genital warts. Uh, in 2014, uh, the um, Gardasil was expanded to a nine-valent vaccine uh, that basically added five more of the subtypes that are associated with cancers. Uh, and uh, since that time, this is the only vaccine that is available in the United States for use is the nine-valent Gardasil vaccine. Uh, initially, three doses uh, were required, uh, and recently in 2016, uh, it has been changed to two doses uh, as long as those, the vaccination begins in children who are under 14 at the start of their uh, uh, vaccination schedule. Once they are 15 and over, uh, they will still require three doses of vaccine. And as of December of 2017, greater than 100 million doses of HPV vaccine have been given around the world. Uh, this is a 
busy slide, but I want you to just see that uh, HPV 16 and 18, again, are the predominant types associated with cervical cancer in women and oropharyngeal cancer in men, and I think a lot of our speakers have reinforced that. Uh, these are the additional five uh, types of vaccine that were added to the nine-valent vaccine. Uh, so the original four plus these five is the nine-valent uh, Gardasil vaccine, which is what is used today. Um, and you can see that there are uh, uh, cancers of the cervix that uh, um, are caused by these additional five types. Uh, that's less of a problem in the oropharyngeal cancer. Uh, but again, 16 and 18 are really the predominant types in uh, most of the cancers that we're talking about uh, on this slide. Uh, this is just a vaccine schedule that I've already mentioned. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that's been somewhat confusing for primary care providers because we were um, used to recommending three doses. Uh, but again, those vaccination uh, rules have changed uh, because studies have shown that the vaccine is more effective if you give it younger, so then they only need two doses. Um, that is different for children who are immunocompromised, uh, in which they will still need three doses. Um, but I also want you to note that the vaccine can be given up to 26 years of age. Uh, so for those of you who take care of uh, older patients, um, uh, know that uh, they can still receive the vaccine. But again, the vaccine is most effective if we give it before any sexual um, activity uh, or any exposure to any of the types of HPV vaccine. So again, we want to try to get it into those uh, younger patients where it's the most effective. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how it works. Uh, all of the HPV vaccines that have been developed are highly, highly uh, immunogenic. Uh, and that means they uh, induce very significant uh, antibody levels. Yeah. Oh, sure. I think, you know what, I'll just hold it. This might be better. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so these are uh, studies done on the antibody levels oops, from HPV 16. Uh, and you will note that uh, the, this is the level of natural immunity after infection. Uh, the darker kind of green bars here are the placebo patients. Uh, so the patients who receive vaccine have very, very robust antibody production uh, that in some cases is more than 10 times the antibody level from natural infection. Uh, so these vaccines do work. Uh, this is similar data for uh, HPV-18 uh, uh, antibody response. And again, here's the level of natural uh, uh, antibody level after infection. Uh, and these are the um, antibody levels after vaccination. And again, placebo doesn't uh, approach any of these levels. Uh, this whole next section is uh, on HPV vaccine safety, uh, which is something that I think is really important to note. Uh, lots of families read a lot of things on the internet about HPV vaccine, and there are a lot of stories that are circulated that are simply untrue. Uh, the Vaccine uh, Adverse Events Reporting System uh, is uh, something uh, is uh, established through the CDC, and it is there to look for uh, vaccines that may actually cause harm. So these uh, reporting systems are in place. Anyone can report uh, uh, a concern regarding a vaccination. So the public, uh, health providers, anybody can. And what's interesting is that, uh, the, again, the HPV vaccine was approved for use in 2006. Subsequent to that, there were a large number of uh, reported concerns regarding HPV vaccine. But as you can see, over time, uh, the levels of actual reports have really decreased significantly, as well as the level of serious concerns. Uh, uh, down to almost undetectable. So we think that this is, um, again, with any new thing, uh, lots of people have concerns about it, and so there may have been uh, lots of reporting that maybe wasn't associated with HPV. We don't think it was associated with HPV. It certainly, over time, has not borne out uh, that uh, all of these concerns were necessarily related to the vaccine. Um, I want to uh, mention that uh, these systems do work. Uh, for those pediatricians in the room, you'll know that uh, in the 1990s, way back when there, were, there was a vaccine for rotavirus uh, introduced, RotaShield. Um, and uh, when it was, even though it had been studied and it was licensed by the FDA, uh, when it started being used in clinical practice, there were reports of intussusception uh, for infants. Intussusception is a telescoping of the intestines in upon themselves, and it's a very serious problem and it uh, is an emergency. Uh, and as the reports continue to come through to the uh, VAERS reporting system, uh, the the FDA looked into those claims, and the vaccine was pulled from the market. So uh, for those um, in the public who um, propagate these stories about HPV vaccine and it's so dangerous and they know that it's dangerous, 
it isn't. These, the, you know, again, we continue to monitor. The vaccine's been available for more than 10 years. Uh, it's been studied extensively, and it is safe. We're going to talk a few about those studies that have been done. Uh, this is a very busy slide, and I apologize. Uh, this is what's out there. But these were, oops. Uh, these uh, were uh, a number of studies that looked at close to a million patients, uh, and what they were specifically looking for were endpoints that included these uh, specific diagnoses, Guillain-Barre syndrome, stroke, appendicitis, seizure, allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, syncope, and venous thromboembolism. Um, they also looked at concerns about autoimmune diseases. So again, there were these reports in the public and I think propagated uh, on the internet uh, about things that were associated with the HPV vaccine. So they specifically looked to see whether they were noticing these conditions in patients who had received HPV vaccine. And as you can see here, they're really unable uh, to find those. They were unable to um, uh, correlate those with HPV vaccination. The only thing they did find uh, here uh, is that HPV vaccine has been associated with syncope uh, and skin infection. Um, and when they say skin infection, what's interesting is they count anything, including even redness of the skin at the injection site as a skin infection. Uh, so does, does that happen with HPV vaccine? Can there be redness at the injection site? Of course, with any vaccination, there can be redness at the, at the injection site. Uh, the concerns about syncope um, are true, and we have seen that. I've seen it in my own practice. Uh, and it has led to a recommendation that patients be seated for 15 minutes following the vaccination. Um, that uh, seems to uh, help most kids, uh, and the few that I've had, uh, one was a female and one was a male who passed out after their vaccine. They didn't really pass out. They got a little woozy, a little bit of juice, and some graham crackers fix them right up. So uh, that's what I can say about my own experience with syncope in the office. But it's a, it's, it, it can be very concerning. Parents certainly are kind of freaked out about it, especially if that happens with the first dose and they know they need another dose or two doses. Uh, there can be some worry, and so we just reiterate that they really should remain seated for 15 minutes afterward, uh, and most kids do just fine. Uh, these are uh, more studies that were done. Again, these are all post-licensing, so that means that they were all studied initially, then they were uh, approved and used in the public. Uh, um, this uh, includes a couple of studies that are on the previous slide, but basically in these nine studies, they had greater than 500,000 patients, uh, they gave greater than 1 million doses of the vaccine, and the only associated finding was syncope and skin infection. So that's just so that you know that HPV vaccine, again, has been studied and is safe. Uh, this is a little transition slide as we're going to talk about vaccination uh, rates in the United States. Uh, these, are for oops, wait, I just do that. these are for teenagers in the U.S., and this is the reporting period. Uh, and what you can see on this slide is that um, this is a line for uh, Tdap vaccination, this is meningococcal vaccine, and here's HPV vaccine. And these are grouped somewhat together because these are the adolescent vaccines. So typically patients are receiving all of these at the same time if they're receiving them. So again, you can see that there are very high rates of Tdap, which is the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccine, uh, the meningitis vaccine here, and the HPV vaccine. Uh, so that's kind of the focus of today's uh, symposium is uh, HPV vaccine is safe, it works, but somehow we're unable to really get that, um, have adolescents uh, be able to receive it um, as they should and on time. Uh, this slide um, I like um, because as we think about what can we do to improve HPV vaccination rates, there are certain uh, pockets where there's more resistance uh, to HPV vaccine. Uh, oh my gosh, I apologize. <laughs> okay, here. Uh, so on this slide, you'll see that uh, we have higher acceptance rates. These are for females receiving the first dose of HPV vaccine, uh, and the rates are in the 70s uh, for uh, Asian, non-Hispanic, and for Hispanic populations. Uh, but the lowest uh, rates of HPV um, starting the series are actually in white populations. Uh, in males, uh, we see lower numbers. Again, males uh, were added to the FDA um, uh, indication later, and so we've had less time to get them vaccinated. Um, but still you see that there's better rates in basically every other ethnic group besides white. Uh, so there's, again, there's pockets of resistance, uh, especially among, um, as someone else had already talked about, and I think Garrett will cover uh, in his vaccine um, uh, hesitancy groups. Uh, there's something about our communication, uh, or there's something that we really need to be doing differently when working with white families uh, to try to uh, enhance HPV vaccination. Uh, this is um, other information that just shows you kind of where we need to dedicate resources. <clears throat> These are obviously graphs of 
uh, the states in the United States. Uh, and what you can see overall uh, is that uh, for females receiving one dose of HPV vaccine, we do better on the coast. California uh, has higher rates as well as the Northeast um, and the other states um, here are the, the measurements down here. But what I just want you to see globally, if you just look at the slide, uh, is you'll just see that there's kind of a dearth of uh, um, adequate coverage really in the South. Again, these are uh, where efforts are being um, uh, uh, reinforced, uh, where we need better communication or you know, what can we do to really uh, enhance vaccination rates there. Uh, for males, again, you'll see better rates in the Northeast and California, um, but this very, very kind of open space uh, in the in the South, and interestingly, uh, Wyoming uh, is a part where there's, uh, we don't really have very good vaccination coverage. Uh, this is a very busy slide, and I apologize, but I just want you to note uh, here, this is actually state by state what the vaccine rates are for HPV, uh, and what you'll see is that Rhode Island uh, is the star. They have nearly 90% vaccination coverage for HPV, um, and I'll tell you in a minute why that's so special. Um, uh, being competitive people, this is Minnesota. Uh, 50, oh, lordy, this is 59.1% here. So we really were uh, so far behind, almost 30 points behind uh, Rhode Island in HPV vaccine coverage. And then the lowest uh, state is actually Wyoming here. Uh, this is uh, how Rhode Island uh, was able to work their magic because in Rhode Island, HPV vaccine is required for school entry. Um, we know that that works very, very well. Uh, if states can require it uh, and mandate it, it happens. Uh, there's no higher rate of Guillain-Barre syndrome here or autoimmune diseases in teenagers, although they have these uh, really remarkable high rates of vaccination. So in Rhode Island, to go in the seventh grade, you need one dose. To go in the eighth grade, you need two doses. Uh, and they acknowledge here that there's been a change so, um, in, the, in the number of doses. So once you have your two doses now, if you started the vaccine under the age of 15, you're done. You don't need the third dose that is on this slide here. Uh, why do parents uh, refuse vaccine? Uh, this is just a study um, where parents uh, um, re reported that about 20% of them feel that the vaccine is just not necessary, it's not needed. Uh, here's uh, where we're gonna come in, uh, where it's not recommended, not recommended by the provider. Uh, we know how important it is for providers, all providers, dental providers, medical providers, uh, anyone who deals with patients to be able to speak positively about the HPV vaccine uh, and to clearly recommend it uh, is what families really are needing and what they're looking to us for, our expert opinion. That's why they come to us. Um, there's uh, the concern regarding safety uh, and side effects. And again, as we just discussed, uh, there have been numerous studies and millions of patients studied, and there's just not, we're not able to really um, uh, bear out those concerns. So the good news is the HPV vaccine is safe. Uh, lack of knowledge uh, about the vaccine or disease, that's what we're talking about today. I do think that the general public doesn't have any idea or has little idea about what HPV can really do. Um, and many, many parents who uh, feel that their child is too young and they don't need the vaccine because they're not sexually active, that's exactly why they deem the vaccine, because they're not sexually active. So they're not at risk, they haven't been exposed to HPV, and we want to vaccinate them early. Uh, so the role of the medical providers uh, is education for ourselves, uh, certainly recommending HPV vaccine, focusing on the cancer prevention, I think, more than anything. Um, I think that's what really um, uh, is persuasive to families. Um, be prepared for questions. I think um, many uh, medical providers don't want to start the conversation because they're worried about you know, being able to answer the family's questions, but we need to educate ourselves so we can uh, give that strong recommendation and or direct families to where they can get more information if they really have uh, great concerns. Uh, there's lots of great resources on the internet. Um, the CDC has great resources. The American Academy of Pediatrics has just come up with brand new resources. Uh, specifically directed at dental providers uh, so that they can answer the questions in their offices. We'll have links to those. Um, for uh, uh, primary care providers to know that every visit is an opportunity to vaccinate a child. Uh, so if they don't have any uh, contraindications, they're not there with a fever 105 or influenza that day, is probably not the best day to talk about vaccine. Uh, but there are many, many opportunities that children are being seen, adolescents are being seen, where we could be offering vaccine and really um, uh, getting it done, even maybe it's not in the context of a well child visit. So we know that when kids are presenting for vaccines for other vaccines, uh, somehow HPV is just not getting uh, completed at that visit. 
uh, for children who are presenting for their checkups, uh, this is the perfect time to be looking at their vaccination schedule, what they're due for, giving those vaccines today and getting them accomplished, um, and visits with their own primary care providers. Again, occasionally families uh, want to wait and talk to their regular provider. They feel more confident talking with someone they know. Um, but, it, but even when they see their primary care provider, we're still missing all these opportunities to vaccinate these kids. Uh, this is just interesting information on cognitive bias, which is uh, to know that in, in pediatrics, we don't really see a lot of uh, oral cancer or diagnose patients with oropharyngeal cancer, so it may not be uh, kind of in our realm of reality, uh, but that's what this conference today is to inform people about. It's out there, and we are uh, on the leading edge of it um, to know that we, we're all worried about the cases of meningitis. Uh, we're worried about tetanus, but we can look at the number of deaths that come from these vaccine-preventable uh, diseases. Uh, HPV by far uh, causes more deaths than the other vaccinations or the other diseases for which we vaccinate. Uh, so we just need to be aware that if we can, uh, again, uh, do our part early on, uh, we can prevent these deaths later on. Uh, it will take a village. That's what this conference is for. Uh, it requires all healthcare providers who are around patients who can be vaccinated to, again, give those messages to them. Uh, we know that dental, oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, dental providers should strongly and clearly recommend HPV vaccine. That's also gonna be reiterated in Dr. Jones' uh, session next. Uh, the role of the dental professional is to educate themselves on the appearance of HPV signs and symptoms, uh, just as you uh, guys learned in the first part of today's symposium. We want to be able to educate patients on HPV and HPV-related cancers and to encourage and refer patients for vaccine, especially at that critical 11 and 12 year age range. And the last slide is just a great visual, uh, and this is a resource from the CDC, and it says, you would do anything to protect your child from cancer, but have you done everything? So with that, I'm done, and we'll have the next speaker. Our next speaker is Garrett Jones. Dr. Jones is a practicing pediatrician at Park Nicolette Brookdale Clinic. He received grant funding for a project during his residency on HPV vaccine hesitancy. He's an eager, talented newbie to the pediatric practice world. We're lucky to have him speak this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Garrett. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Crespo. Um, we've heard a lot today about the importance of preventing HPV uh, infections when it comes to the oropharyngeal cancers. We've now heard that our vaccination rates are nowhere near where they need to be. Um, and so that begs the question of why. Why are our vaccination rates not where they are? And that's the next thing we're going to talk about. So first of all, I have no disclosures. I do care a lot about vaccines, and I talk a lot about it. So I apologize. Um, we'll, two, we'll talk about two big things today. One is why do people say no to the HPV vaccine? And that's one of the things that Dr. Crespo has alluded to in a lot of ways. And then the next question that follows from that is then what can we do as providers uh, to help with that? So first of all, why do families hesitate? We've talked about some of these things already, but we, by and large, are the number one cause of the poor vaccination rates across the country, especially in the state of Minnesota. We don't do a very good job. We as providers just are not doing our job with it. So when it comes to this unfortunate fact, um, there's great data that suggests this as well. Some of the studies are a little bit older, but this continues, has been continuing um, even now, that when you look across the board and survey providers, pediatric providers, family practice providers, and asking, do, we, do you highly recommend the HPV vaccine? And unfortunately, we don't do a very good job. So you can see from this slide, so about 75% of the time we're recommending it for girls. Great, that's still not 100%. Um, and for boys, less than half the time. That is not acceptable. When you look at the same, the same study here looked at the other adolescent uh, vaccines, things like the Tdap and the meningitis vaccine, our rates of, of rec strong recommendation are above 95% for those vaccines. What is it, what are we not doing um, with the HPV vaccine? And you can imagine parents, when they hear these things, they're, if we're not recommending it, parents aren't gonna do it. Um, they look to us to be the ones to to tell them what to do when it comes to the safety uh, and health of their children. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the next data point there, but basically, um, why aren't we doing it? And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, there's another study here. This was actually just uh, published earlier this year, uh, and they looked at specifically 
people who initially declined the HPV vaccine and then following up, were they ever um, follow up um, if later on actually vaccinated for this? And they found it was about 45% of the time they were, which is good news. Um, but unfortunately, we, again, the same topic, we're not doing a very good job of recommending it. Only half the time was a provider actually recommending it the next time the patient came to the clinic. So the way this plays out is someone comes into your clinic for an 11-year well-child visit you talk about the vaccines they're due for. They say no to the HPV vaccine. When they come back again for 12, at their 12-year visit, you don't mention it again. No one talks about it. And so what the family hears from that is, I guess it's not important. If they mention it the first time and I said no, and no one asked me again, it can't be that important. And that's what the family hears. That's the reading between the lines that they do. Um, and with the same study, they showed that if you are actually strongly recommending it with much, much higher rates of, of accepting the vaccine down the road. So why don't we do it? We alluded to this a little bit already. So time, the majority of the time, it takes at least 10 minutes to talk to a family about their vaccine hesitancy and their vaccine questions. That's at the bare minimum. Sometimes it's 20 or 30 minutes. If you've got a busy clinic day, that's time that we don't have. Um, and the other reasons that we often see is uncomfortable with parent questions. The longer you do this, the more kind of crazy off the wall questions you may hear that come from families that they read on a blog somewhere. And sometimes we don't feel comfortable answering those or you just don't feel like you're up to date with all the literature. And I just don't, I don't want to engage because I don't know how I'm going to respond to those questions. Um, and then in a growing world of patient satisfaction scores, we worry that maybe if I talk too much about this, if I, if I push too much and, and make the family uncomfortable, how is that going to be affected in there? The, the survey they get two days later about their patient satisfaction is how is that going to affect my standing within the organization that I work for? So I want to shift gears a little bit. So we've talked a little bit about um, why we aren't doing our job. There are some myths that have been circulated around as well about the HPV vaccine. This is one of them. It's not quite as um, uh, common anymore, but it's certainly something that we hear. In fact, just a few days ago, I heard the, this concern. The idea behind this was that HPV is a sexually transmitted disease. If we vaccinate a child for a sexually transmitted disease, that somehow gives them free reign to go out and have sex with whomever they please as often. Um, and that's what parents get, have been concerned about. And the data shows that that is absolutely not true. Um, there have been some great studies. The one from 2012 was really the, one of the early studies looking at that. Um, and they show that there's no, no co correlation or causal link between the HPV vaccine and any marker for increased sexual activity in teenagers. Things like contraceptive visits, um, STD checks or positive STD testing, uh, early teen pregnancies, none of those have been true. And follow-up studies, really large scale, this was done in, in Canada, over a, a quarter of a million girls were, were, were surveyed with this who have been vaccinated with HPV um, and showed absolutely no increased risk of it. So it's just, um, it's unfortunately a myth that's out there. Uh, and part of our job, and we'll talk about this later, is to, to debunk some of those myths and address these head on when people have them um, because we don't want it to continue to propagate out there. And the other thing is school requirements. Unfortunately, um, and as Dr. Crespo alluded to, there are a few states, Rhode Island is one of them, the District of Columbia, and I believe Virginia, the three um, states or districts that require um, HPV vaccine for school attendance. The rest of them do not. Um, as of now, there's some legislature that's uh, trying to be passed in New York City, right, uh, New York State right now, um, but it is not yet passed. And so unfortunately, this is what our vaccine um, their immunization form for school attendance looks like. And as you can see, under the recommended but not required is HPV vaccine. One of the things that we saw just in the last talk, if we require it by the state law, the vaccination rate goes sky high. It's, um, and that's what we, you know, it's one of the things that we need to do. That's not something that we're going to be doing in a room with an individual patient or an individual family. But that is one of the areas that we know will help with vaccine rates and increasing those vaccine rates. Um, and then lastly, I don't want to spend too much time with this because we've already um, talked a lot about it with vaccine um, safety, but if families come in or if they Google HPV vaccine safety, one of the first things they see are websites and, and there's a recent movie that came out even about this, the, the vaccine, the concern for vaccine safety. There was a movie um, put out about two years ago now called Vaxxed by Andrew Wakefield and kind of an anti-vaccine community that uh, in one of the storylines within that movie was an 11-year-old boy, um, well, it was initially 11-year-old, but who went through uh, this, the full HPV series, this was now several years ago, uh, and after about two weeks after the last dose of his three HPV series, 
developed transverse myelitis, developed, um, you basically was um, paralyzed from the neck down, was in a wheelchair bound, was trache um, tracheostomy dependent. That is not a, that is, that, so it's been circulated out there, and you may hear that, or people read that, watch that, and they come in and they talk to you about that. They say, I'm concerned, I saw this movie. What can you do about that? And, and one of the things that we've, we've already shown is that there really isn't that concern. Um, that none of those have been borne out to be true in large, large scale um, vaccine safety studies. So I'm gonna move on past this. Um, and so that begs the question, then what is it that we can do? What can we as providers do to increase the vaccination rates because it is so important. And like I said, we're not doing a very good job of it. So the first thing we have to be is presumptive. It's kind of an odd um, terminology, but it, uh, it's borne out from uh, a study that was done a few years ago about the way we approach initial vaccine conversations. So the way when we come in the room and we have our first conversation about vaccines with the family, it exists, that communication exists on a spectrum. On one end is presumptive language, and on the other is what's called participatory language. And those of us who've gone through medical school, dental school, we're always taught participatory. That sounds good. That sounds like we want to engage the family. It sounds like that shared decision-making that we're all taught. And this is the one time where that isn't the case. We don't want to do that. And the way this sounds um, is, so a presumptive way to approach a family is that you're, today your child will be getting the HPV vaccine, or today your child is due for the HPV vaccine. The assumption there is that they're going to do it. Um, part of this is we want to show that strong foot forward. We want to put our best foot forward. We want families to know that we strongly recommend this. This is incredibly important, and I care so much about your child's health that I am assuming that you're going to do the vaccine. The flip side of that, the participatory language, is a little more wishy-washy. It sounds like, well, what do you feel about the HPV vaccine? What do you want to do about that one today? And the, what the parents hear from that and families hear is that, well, it can't be that important. They're not, my pediatrician, my family practice provider, my dentist isn't strongly recommending it, so, and they're asking my opinion, it can't be that important. Um, and again, this, you know, this is borne out in the literature as well. So this was just an AAP news brief from just last summer that shows, and, I'll, and I'll, we'll talk about the study here in a few minutes, but basically, even specifically with HPV vaccine, when we use that presumptive language, it makes a big difference. Um, so this first study is the one that I talked about, the, the, really the initial study about vaccine uh, language. This was not done on, on HPV vaccine. This was really more geared toward the early uh, infant vaccines, <clears throat> but the data is still um, pretty shocking. When we start a conversation with that presumptive language, the vast majority of the time, people are just gonna say yes. Certainly if people have strong questions, and we'll talk about that later, about how to engage that. You know, we, want, we don't want people to feel that they can't ask questions, but the number of times that people may have some initial hesitancy, but you come out and are strong in your recommendation, that puts people at ease. People are looking to their providers to give them the recommendations. They assume that we know what we're talking about. They assume that we know what's best for their child. And when we approach it in that way, it puts families at ease. It makes them feel more comfortable. Even if they had some initial hesitations, they're gonna be more likely to accept it. And as you can see here in this study specifically, when we use that participatory language, they, well, how do you feel about vaccines today? The vast majority of the time, people hesitate, they resist. Um, or they try to say, well, maybe not your way. Let's tr maybe we'll think about a different way. How about we do it a different way? Um, the next study here was the one that was alluded to from the AAP News Brief. Um, and this one was, was particularly interesting because it was just specifically related to HPV vaccine um, acceptance. Unfortunately, with this, the uh, overall vaccine acceptance rate was about 30% um, for the thing, that day vaccine for HPV, which is quite, quite low. Um, and this looked at uh, about, five, uh, about, excuse me, about 500 um, pediatric visits in the 11 to 12 year range. And what they found though was the, unfortunately the vast majority of the time people use participatory language, which is one of the reasons why the vaccine, vaccination rate was so low. But within the, the, those people who use the presumptive language, your child will be getting the HPV vaccine today. Again, the vast majority of the time people said yes. And that is if you learn nothing else from today, from what, or at least what I'm talking about, there's a lot to learn today. But from the things that I'm talking about today, remember to be presumptive. Put your best foot forward. Be strong in that initial recommendation. And the other thing that goes along with this is we don't want to offer to delay the vaccine. Again, the same study showed that, that unfortunately about two-thirds of the time, 
providers either offered or even in some cases recommended delaying the vaccine. And again, this is right at that 11 and 12 year visits where we want to be starting the vaccine series. This is truly unacceptable. We cannot be offering and especially recommending that we, that we delay the vaccine. Because again, as we've been talking about what families hear from that is that this isn't that important. If my provider is telling me that it's okay, well, we'll do it later. Well, maybe we'll do it when, when, when he or she gets a little bit older. What they're hearing, reading between the lines there, is it's not that important. And that's what we have to, we have to do better, do a better job of showing families that it's incredibly important. Um, and again, you can see the data here. When we offer to delay, of course they're gonna take it up, us up on that offer. You know, you've got an 11 or 12 year old who's sitting next to a parent saying, yes, there's one less vaccine today. So they're gonna say yes, they're gonna put pressure on the parents. The parents are gonna, again, hearing this, oh, maybe I guess it's not that important. We'll do that one again next year. And as we talked about initially, only about half the time we ever actually have that discussion again. So we're not doing a very good job um, on either end of it, um, the initial visit or even on the, on, the, on, the back side, on, the, on the subsequent visits. So second of all, be a myth buster. It's okay to address people's concerns. People will come and they will have, they'll have read something interesting on the internet or they'll have seen the movie um, and they'll come up with their own concerns. And one of the things we want to do is, is talk about that, approach that with people. But we certainly want to do it in a respectful way. Part of the importance of, really one of the most important things about any vaccine hesitant discussion is building communication with families. That is where people are going to buy into what you're saying is if they can look at you, if they feel that you know what you're talking about, you have their child's best interest at heart, and, um, and you've built that rapport. We don't want to ever get into a, a discussion of your facts are better than my facts. That doesn't work. When you approach this too in that kind of confrontational way of, well, you don't know what you're talking about. That's a, you know, where did you read that? That's crazy. That doesn't work. People will pull back and they'll find somewhere else. They'll, then they're less likely to actually agree with what you're saying. If you approach it in a respectful way, but still discuss. Well, that's, you know, I understand your concerns. There's a lot of information about there about um, vaccine safety. I've done my research. This is what the, the, the research shows. People respect that and they will, um, and they will listen. So the case method is something that was um, kind of born out of um, uh, the, the, the language of how to approach a, um, a vaccine hesitant family. What this is, is a framework, it's an architecture for having the, the a discussion with a vaccine hesitant parent. Um, it certainly doesn't work perfectly every time and it needs to be adjusted for each individual person. But it's a good way in the back of your mind to think, okay, I've got someone who's hesitating with the vaccine, how am I gonna approach that? Because most of us, if you're not doing it on a regular basis, we, we kind of shy away. It's, it's, it's much harder to then engage with a vaccine hesitant family than it is to just say, okay, well, we're not gonna do that today. Well, maybe then we talk about it, we'll do it next year. So we wanna have this, this framework where you feel comfortable and feel confident having these discussions. So it stands for, and we'll talk about this more in the, in the, in the breakout session, but we'll go over it briefly here. So one is we want to corroborate the parents' concerns. We want to get the buy-in. We wanna build that common ground. We wanna build the rapport. So acknowledge their concerns. Don't let people be vague about it though. So if people have a concern, ask them, what are their specific concerns? And then using yourself, you know, using the, your knowledge and the, the rest of these tools to, to try to find that common ground. I understand that's a lot of great information out there. There's a lot of scary things out there. And I understand how you would be concerned about that. Get that buy-in. The about me is very different whether or not you've been practicing for a long time and have a, you know, now a 12 year relationship with this family or if you're just meeting for the first time. But the idea behind this part of, of the, the framework is telling people why should they believe you? Why, should, why are you the expert? Who, why should I believe you? And again, if this is someone that you've, you've known for a very long time, this is maybe a little bit different than if, it, than if you're meeting them for the first time. But it's an important thing um, uh, to talk about. The S is for science. Science can be tricky. In some families, they want data, they want to look at the studies, they want that information. In a lot of ways, people gloss over when you talk about the science, you talk about data with them. So this is, you have to tweak it a little bit based on who's in front of you. Um, but it's okay to talk about the research. Again, you know, we wanna have, it's okay to talk about facts, um, but doing it in a, in a way that um, is appropriate for the patient who's sitting in front of you. And lastly, E is for explain or advise, or I like the word express. Express your, your strong emotions. 
strong convictions and why do I think this is so much important for you and your, your, your child. Be clear, we don't want, especially after a long conversation like this, to leave the family with any ambiguity of saying, well, what did he mean again? I guess we'd had this long conversation, but to be honest, I don't remember what, we, what he actually told me in the end. Be clear with what you're, what you're recommending at the end. So the next part is because, unfortunately, we can't convince everybody to do what we say, regardless of what it is, but especially with, with vaccines, we can't always um, convince people that day to do what we recommend. Referring people to more reliable resources is an important part of that because there's so much misinformation out there that we want to make sure that people are going to the appropriate sites. They're not going to uh, Dr. Bob's website to look at this. They want to go to, you know, to a reliable place to, to get that information. Um, so going to places like the CDC, there's great resources um, for both the X, uh, HPV vaccine in general, HPV vaccine hesitancy, um, the Minnesota Department of Health. There is a whole area for teens there as well. There's a great video um, that I included in the link with this, and I think everyone has access to that. Um, so there's a, a great video of, of kind of talking about providers and being able to, um, to have those discussions with families. If you haven't been to these kind of websites before, I would encourage you to make that your weekend homework, to look at these and see what, um, see what patients are seeing and seeing what, what kind of great resources, both for healthcare professionals as well as for, um, for our families. The, um, the other ones that are, are also great is immunize.org, which is part of the Immunization Action Coalition, and even the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has a vaccine education center, is including an app on your phone, which I've actually used in clinic a number of times. So both of those are great resources as well, in addition to these. Um, the last thing I want to mention, though, before we get to this is we want to make a follow-up plan, too. So don't let someone leave your clinic who says no to the, vac the HPV vaccine without some sort of a plan in place. Sometimes that is, I want you to go home, we're going to read over these great resources, and then I'll call you in two weeks. Or how about you come back and see me in a month and we'll talk more about this. Or when you come back for your 12-year visit, we're going to talk about it again. And make sure that people know that you're strongly recommending this and that you're going to bring it up again, because that tells the parents how, how powerful you feel this is, this is and how important it is. So with that, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Um, I'd like to uh, have our last patient speaker come up, Steve Milne, who's going to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Katamani. Um, so my story, uh, my cancer story actually came in a very happy time in my life. I had just gotten married in August of 2016. I had just moved into my apartment in St. Louis Park, and I just noticed a, uh, a small tumor on the underside of my tongue. I didn't know it was a tumor. I thought it was an infection uh, at the time. I, uh, it was bugging me when I was eating. I actually had symptoms, so I was one of the lucky people because as we have uh, learned today, it doesn't always show up uh, in symptoms. And uh, I actually went to my primary care physician. It was a great guy. He was actually on vacation, so I saw an assistant physician. And she told me, I probably just bit my tongue. Uh, it's nothing to worry about. And I guess this is why this event today is even more particularly relevant to me because I had a dentist appointment just by chance the next week. And I went to my dentist and he said, that's not nothing. And he put me on a really powerful antibiotic and he called me every day <laughs> for the next week wondering if the uh, uh, tumor had shrunk. And I said, no, it has not. And he immediately referred me to an oral surgeon. And so uh, I went into the oral surgeon and did the biopsy, which was not fun. Uh, that was probably the worst part. I actually tell kind of money, the uh, biopsy was worse than the actual surgery because they just give you a little gas. You know, the surgery, you're gone. You wake up, you're on drugs, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's not that bad. Uh, but <laughs> the biopsy, they're like, all right, well, uh, you know, uh, walk the gas off for 15 minutes and, uh, you know, drive home. And he gave me a, a, a prescription for some pain medication, I remember waiting in the, uh, the Walgreens, and I was just dying. I was, like, sweating uh, because of the, the, the pain in my tongue, and I just went home, and I was like, that was awful. But uh, you know what? It, it, it probably saved my life, I guess, to a certain extent. Um, they said they were going to call me with the test results. Uh, and when I didn't get that call, and they actually called and said, they actually, I forget if they emailed me or left me a voicemail. They said, actually, I want you to come in. I was like, oh, man. 
Uh, and so I came in, and I still wasn't even thinking cancer at this point. I was just like, oh, yeah, it must be a really bad infection or something. And uh, But they sat me down. They said, you know, you got uh, squamous cell carcinoma. It's a form of uh, skin cancer. Um, he's like, you know, just kind of ran me through how do you get it was the thing. I had a great doctor. He's a, a fantastic guy, and he immediately referred me to uh, Dr. Katamani. And uh, I set up that appointment, came in, and uh, just learned a little bit more about the, the treatment options at that point. Um, November 30th, I believe it was, 2016, is when I had my surgery. Uh, I had the uh, tumor removed from my tongue and the neck dissection uh, as well. Uh, I remember discussing uh, treatment options with Dr. Katamani, and I, I will say, he asked him, he said, you don't have to have the neck dissection, I guess, if you don't want. And they're like, well, <laughs> what would you do if it was your kid? And Dr. Kamani said, wouldn't even be an option. And I said, well, that's what we're doing. And I will say that kind of, you know, care is something that I came to expect, I suppose. And I, maybe I took for granted at the time, but I've learned to appreciate more is uh, the team over at, at North Memorial. They're the best. And... I will say this gives a lot, like, like I said, it gives a lot more relevancy to this today because if it wasn't for my dentist, once again, I, it might have spread to my lymph nodes, which thank God it didn't. It might have been stage four by the time I came in. And, you know, the, you guys are on the front line of, of this, and you're the ones that have to say something because, you know, I don't, my, the, uh, the physician that I saw, she doesn't deal with this on a daily basis. She doesn't see this stuff. The mouth is not her specialty. It, it's yours. And, uh, you know, I, I, I will say if, if, if I've learned anything is that how lucky I am because of you guys. And uh, I, I might not be standing here. And, you know, the, the real heroes are, are you guys in, in the Jills. I mean, what, what she went through. I mean, I didn't have to do radiation. I didn't have to do chemo because my dentist, <laughs> he caught it early. He said, you got to check this out. I mean, think about what I was spared. I mean, Jill, like her story is that's. That's crazy. And what she went through, four kids. I mean, I'm, I'm married. I have no kids. I'm 27. I, I mean, it, it's just, you know, I'm so lucky. So help other people, I guess, achieve the same outcome as me. You know, help, help other people be as lucky as I am. And, and that's really on you guys. And, and I, uh, I, I, it's a big burden. I guess it's a big thing to ask. But, you know, you guys are in a great position to do that. And, and this is really cool because of that. And, uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. So, so we're just going to have the question and answer portion for uh, the second session on prevention. So I think there's going to be people running through the crowd if there's anyone who has any questions. I'm just wondering, uh, is there value in vaccinating someone who has already had a cancer? Is that common practice? Um, that's interesting. Uh, what I would say is um, we know that HPV vaccine is indicated, um, again, um, as I showed on a few of my slides, from ages nine is the youngest that it's approved for, and up to 26 uh, is what it's approved for. So there's, there's not really an indication for that. Again, once the patient has cancer, they've already been exposed to HPV. It's already doing its thing. Um, so the vaccine only covers those nine uh, types that I showed on that slide. So um, if they've already been infected with a type that uh, even was covered by the vaccine but they weren't vaccinated, it's probably not going to make a difference for that patient. So if they already have cancer, then they, you've kind of missed that opportunity. So that's why we want to vaccinate these people ahead of time before they're exposed to any of the HPV types. If they already have a cancer that's HPV, uh, so I guess if they, if they had a cancer that wasn't one of the HPV types, maybe. But again, the vaccine is really only indicated between 9 and 26 years of age. Are there questions? Oh, there is a question. Hi. Do you yet, is there any data yet that gives us any clue whether the vaccine is effective for a lifetime or whether we will need to repeat it? Oh, um, so on the slides that I showed, actually the, the two first slides showing the antibody levels, those were following patients for 10 years. Uh, so actually, the, the vaccine is very efficacious. The antibody levels really remain very high, um, if you saw on those slides. And uh, at the end of the conference, you'll get a WebEx um, link if you wanted to see any of those slides again. Um, but yes, the, for the 10 years that most of those patients were followed, um, the vaccine levels remain very, very high. 
Just a quick question. How much of the re reluctance, resistance is from either the cost or lack of insurance reimbursement? Is any of it due to that? No. From the best of my knowledge, no. I think most of the, the reluctant, reluctance comes um, for those reasons that we talked about. And one of those, you know, the, the biggest one is our communication with families and them not feeling. And as I think there was a slide from Dr. Crespo as well, that the top five reasons, and if you really kind of boil those down, about four or three to four of those are directly related to our ability to communicate well with families. But the reimbursement, I have, I have not heard that specifically. Uh, Dr. Crespo, I had a quick comment. The, I have had some people say, should I get the vaccine if I've already been sexually active? And I guess I say yes. You don't know if you're exposed or not. Um, and the other one, I guess my comment is, I will tell people, um, I think it's to 80% of sexually active people have been exposed to the virus, but not everybody gets cancer from it. Um, so I oftentimes will say, you don't know if you're one of those that's going to get cancer or not, so you want to prevent that. So I guess my answer to your question, although I will admit that cancer is usually over 26, um, would be, hey, you got cancer once. I'd sure get the vaccine in case you're in case you're exposed to some of those other HPVs. You're already a cancer, so I would personally, as a physician, recommend that. Um, I don't, that's a little bit different than your recommendation on that, but that's on the sexually active kids. At least that's how I take the approach of yeah, you still need to get it because it could happen. So. Well, I, so I would say um, that I I did treat um, a 21 year old who had genital warts, um, and I did end up offering him HPV vaccine. Um, so I think that's um, quite reasonable. All I'm saying is I think for patients who, have, who already have an HPV cancer, I don't know that the vaccine is going to help for their HPV cancer. And, and, and if they're out of the age range of, of the indication, again, if they're not between 9 and 26, um, then there are, sometimes there are more questions about that, um, insurance coverage and all of that. So I can't remember exactly what the first Gardasil covered and the second Gardasil covered, but if your child had the first one and they're under 26, would you recommend them getting the second one? That's uh, very interesting. Right now there's no recommendation that you need to repeat the vaccine to give them those other five types, um, but I, I guess you could talk with your provider, and I, I have no idea what the insurance coverage would be if they were already vaccinated, even though they only got the, the first one that only had the four subtypes. So it's interesting. I mean, would I, there be any harm to having it a second time? That's right. I, 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 I certainly feel that there's probably no harm in vaccinating again, uh, and they would get those extra five types if they're within those age groups. But I, I don't. I can think that would be kind of a question uh, for the provider. Thank you. Would you agree? Oh, okay, so this would be the last. Is one. it the legislature that decides what vaccines are required, and how close are we to getting Minnesota to require HPV vaccine? Uh, Yes, um, the legislature is who decides, unfortunately, with input from MDH. Um, we are in a very interesting time in Minnesota. There's a lot of concern regarding vaccination uh, that is being kind of escalated up to the uh, legislature. So uh, I was just at an American Academy of Pediatrics board meeting last night, um, and they have a we have a legislative um, representative uh, who was uh, talking to us about kind of all of the interesting movements and how they try to sneak in some of these um, uh, uh, additions to the personal exemption. Uh, we are in Minnesota, we're trying not to necessarily mandate HPV vaccine, but we're trying to remove the personal exemption right now in Minnesota with no authority. You can just say, nope, I don't, I don't believe in vaccines and I don't want to vaccinate my child and you sign a form and they can go to school. You know, in California, they recently um, we're able to um, overturn that, and now in California, it's required for children to be vaccinated to go to school. Otherwise, you need to homeschool them. That, I think, is the, you know, the big stick uh, that really is very effective uh, for families to understand that they need to vaccinate their children if they want them to be uh, around other children. So, unfortunately, yes, the legislature is who decides. Okay. Thank you very much. 